You are so disconnected. Seriously. Okay. All my hearts are a day late. We should be hey, live everyone. now. Hey, Razvan. Let me check audio first. First thing first. Come on, YouTube. You can do it. I see it live. Uh, still both buffering it, here. It's, it is buffering, no, yeah. Now it's streaming. Oh, yeah. Audio seems to be fine. All good. Yep. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good day. Here we are again, the third day of the Open SIP Summit 2021 distributed coming to you from all over the world. For those of you that are joining us for the first time, welcome, welcome. And those of you that are returning, thank you for all of your support. Today, we have another action-packed day full of some great talks. And not to forget that we have the raffle at the end of the day with our updated Picker 4.X. Um, so today, uh, I wanted to uh, start off real quick and let everybody know that uh, our wonderful sponsors over at Subspace, they, uh, they were very generous this year. They turned out big and supported the summit. Just want to let everyone know to take a peek over there, see what, uh, what they're offering. We have uh, William King, who's going to be here today, um, and he'll be our last talk of the day, but he'd be talking to you a little bit about a little bit more about what subspace is doing. So stick around for that. It's going to be really interesting. Kicking off today, um, we have Max. So Maxim Sobolov from Sippy Software. He's going to be talking about open sip it and bringing interop testing to the heart of the community. Max, are you with us? Yep, I am. Just give me a second. I'll set up my presentation. No problem. And for those of you uh, that are listening here and have some loose change in your pocket, make sure that you check out our GoFundMe in regard to the Open Sips uh, audit. Uh, we had a talk from Sandro yesterday. If you want to go and check that out, if you want some more information about what that's about, um, do check out that talk. And if you can, loosen up that change, folks. Reach deep. We're almost there. Max, are we ready? Yep. All right, We're almost second. there. <laughs> Take it away, Max. Take it away. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's, just, let's go that way. Looking good, Max. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, David. All right. I guess um, everything is up. Um, <clears throat> let me switch to the presenter view. Uh, it's my presentation. Oh, yeah. Here it is. All right. Um, hello, everyone. And thank you for joining um, us today uh, for this presentation. Um, and uh, before I begin, I would like to uh, thank uh, the whole OpenSIPS team and um, uh, personally Bogdan uh, for uh, letting us to speak and uh, helping us uh, in, uh, in this endeavor that I'm going to talk about today. It was um, great, um, uh, great help and uh, I appreciate it uh, as much as I can. Um, and then uh, uh, the, the topic of today's presentation would be open um and uh, uh, SIP interoperability testing. Uh, that, that's a new a new uh, venue uh, that we started uh, last year. And uh, I, <clears throat> in this presentation, I will give you a brief overview of the of the event, uh, our goals uh, with it, and uh, how it works. Uh, and how hopefully 
uh, you guys can help us perhaps um, doing this. Uh, before I be, before I begin, uh, and, and it's going to be pretty high level presentation. We have um, quite a lot uh, as resources, more technical. Uh, there will be links uh, during this presentation, so uh, we'll we'll post uh, post the hard copy somewhere after uh, for people uh, who want to uh, check it further. But anyway, to, to give us uh, give a little bit of overview of who we are uh, and uh, why we're doing this. Uh, my uh, my personal experience uh, with uh, with SIP started in about 2003, uh, and uh, we've, we've, I've been uh, uh, getting a job in uh, telecommunication industry and uh, one of the first jobs, and uh, we started. Uh, implementing some SIP, uh, uh, SIP uh, switches. Uh, so we looked around and uh, found a SIP Express router. A uh, few years later, uh, I basically switched few jobs, uh, again, all, all in um, all in the same area and started my own business, uh, which, uh, which we kind of run uh, to this day. So we basically build uh, Career grade uh, class four, class five voice switch platforms uh, at a reasonable cost. Sell support them, and um, basically SIP, SIP is our day-to-day uh, -day job every day um, for all those years. Uh, it, it's been pretty successful here. Uh, we have uh, probably something like 500-200 active customers, and over the years. Uh, got uh, more than 600 deployments uh, uh we also been uh, pretty pretty active in um, using open source uh, again something that that that, that i personally uh, started uh, using in since my university years so we, we basically build it around uh, uh, well-known open source components uh, we also try to give back uh, to community uh, in form of uh, some of the so open source components that we uh, develop, we release, and we also try to um, try try to contribute back in forms of patches and uh, whatnot. Um, so, so some of the, some of the projects that that we did, and uh, some of uh, which you might uh, have heard about or used uh, RTP proxy. We also have. Uh, Full featured Python SIP stack open source, and uh, since few years, we also have uh, open source Golan stack. Uh, on top of that, as I said, we, we try to contribute uh, whenever we have some issues uh, or some missing features. Uh, so, recently, we contribute some uh, pretty good uh, chunk of work uh, to implement uh, uh, better digest notification protocols into open SIPs. Uh, and, and overall, like uh, the, the the product, the product is uh, is our focus is uh, to build platforms that is uh, very operational, cost effective, uh, but also uh, very stable and reliable. Anyway, that's um, that's kind of um, job side of things. Well, so uh, well, so uh, do do quite a lot of uh, open source. Uh, Projects and overall try to be involved in uh, in the communities. Uh, uh, essentially, we have uh, we have a separate uh, kind of uh, informal entity which we call CP Labs, and that is basically just uh, a bunch of hackers uh, that sometimes work together on uh, on various projects. Uh, we also do a semi-regular video podcast uh, which we call CIP Chronicles uh, since COVID started. So. Um, also something that um, people might want to check um, now um, as I said we we try to contribute um, to the to the open source as much as we can uh, over the years uh, we've been uh, we've been basically involved in um, <clears throat> multiple projects some of them are listed here uh, quite few more I guess not uh, not listed uh and uh now now that kind of takes care of um uh, of self introduction uh let's talk a little bit about standards uh, and interoperability in general uh 
Uh, essentially, uh, if you look uh, around, uh, you will find standard of one form or another pretty much everywhere. Um, in modern life, uh, we rely on those standards. I just listed a uh, few of them on this slide, but uh, there is obviously my, many more uh, to talk about. Uh, and uh, uh, those, those standards are not, uh, not usually set in stone. Uh, uh, they, they have their own life cycle. Uh, they got developed uh, initial development, and then there is uh, some refinement period. Uh, and, and then, uh, obviously, as time goes on, uh, those products, uh, so standards uh, uh, get uh, get extended and uh, improved, uh, or maybe some new uh, new case uh, use case come along. Uh, so. so um, Basically, as I said, uh, we're uh, here uh, interested in SIP most of the part, but uh, just just looking at the space, uh, you can you can find similar uh, um, standards uh, everywhere. Uh, and um, as, 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 as the time goes on, uh, those pro standards get get developed, uh, and uh, it's important uh, to have some process. Uh, uh, to uh, for for different vendors uh, implementing the same standard uh, to get together and uh, <clears throat> test their implementations uh, because obviously uh, no implementation is perfect and also uh, as as new um, uh, new new additional uh, features are developed or introduced. Uh, those gets implemented uh, by different people and uh, they might not work very well. Uh, in, 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 in general, in, in industry, this is, um, this is very, very known, um, <clears throat> known problem. And uh, uh, we see in, in each area, there are some organizations who kind of deal with, uh, uh, with uh, making sure that standards are um, <clears throat> Uh, implemented correctly. Uh, there are interoperability laboratories, uh, companies who kind of specialize in in that part. Uh, so, so essentially, we we would expect uh, something like this uh, to be the case for SIP as well, because as as the time goes on, uh, the world develops, uh, uh, and uh, uh, standards need a revision or improvement. Uh, but looking at the SIP, uh, the, the situation was uh, was doing pretty good in the early years. Uh, there was a there was a pretty regular uh, interoperability venue organized by SIP Forum uh, since uh, pretty much SIP 1.0 uh, in 1999. <clears throat> And they did a pretty good job uh, uh, doing it. They, they organized 32 events uh, for the, those years. Uh, and uh, ori originally, it was uh, it was in person uh, series of events, uh, and it was organized uh, uh, and sub sponsored uh, and geared towards commercial, mostly commercial SIP vendors. Uh, those of you who might have um, been to one of those events probably know what I'm talking about. Uh, but uh, as I said, we've been uh, starting pretty small. And for us, uh, even though we, we, we've seen those events, even, uh, we definitely recognized uh, uh, the importance and the need uh, for us as a business to uh, to get involved. It, it was very difficult, uh, both on... Uh, on financial side and also on uh, on the time needed uh, to get uh, get there, because, because as I said, it was in person event and uh, there was a uh, obviously some cost. Uh, uh, part of it was uh, shifted back uh, to the participants. Uh, so, so essentially, we we did uh, we did uh, catch up the very tail of it. We, we managed to get uh, to the last of those events. Uh, CP32. Uh, it was in New Hampshire uh, interoperability laboratory uh, 
uh, they got pretty pretty good uh, good setup there. It's huge uh, huge uh, uh, facility with all kinds of uh, cool equipment uh, to do drops and and stuff. Just uh, um, was um, yeah, that's kind of where I learned uh, quite a lot of importance uh, about this uh, these activities. Uh, so so we went, we went to that event and uh, we absolutely liked it uh, despite the challenges uh, that I mentioned. Um, however, uh, it it was uh, it was uh, unfortunately the last event of this kind. Uh, uh, not 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 exactly clear why, but um, uh, they kind of stopped stopped uh, doing it uh, after that. Not not probably not because we went, but just. Uh, uh, Incidents. Uh, at the same time, what we see uh, in in our uh, kind of day-to-day um, -day work uh, is that SIP uh, SIP is still uh, very active and alive, and we see a lot of uh, uh, new use cases and a lot of extensions and a lot of improvements uh, being made. Uh, pretty much every year, we have <clears throat> at least few RFCs. Uh, Related to SIP uh, being uh, being released and approved, uh, but uh, as I said, we have not seen any activities uh, in the interoperability uh, space. And uh, and, and uh, as I said, uh, we also uh, saw quite few quite few shortcomings of the regional event. Uh, so that's kind of got us uh, got us uh, thinking and. Uh, uh, we considered uh, something uh, something along those lines, but uh, but spin it a little bit differently. Uh, but basically, what what we see in the the past ten years, perhaps, is uh, uh, that there is gradual change in the SIP uh, SIP space uh, in terms of uh, most SIP implementations these days are. Um, Based on, uh, in large part or uh, in significant part, at least on open source implementations, and uh, we've seen this obviously in in working on our own products. We see this uh, uh, going on in the industry itself. Uh, so, so basically, we we wanted to make uh, make uh, something that is more uh, geared towards uh, open source. Uh, Community and open source projects, so we wanted to uh, make uh, barriers of entry as uh, as small as possible. At the same time, we also see uh, how the world also kind of quite changing in terms of uh, most of the stuff uh, uh, that we do these days is pushed uh, to push to the cloud. Uh, so, so basically, we wanted to utilize that as well uh, by 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 organizing this on uh, on some cloud platform instead of <clears throat> having uh, having projects to bring their own uh, hardware or whatever to go with the, with the software. Uh, and another thing that we wanted to do a little bit differently: the original event was uh, was a bit. Um, was a bit uh, restricted in terms of uh, what was uh, publicly available, and uh, they, they had their own uh, reasons to do it because, obviously, since the event was uh, organized and geared towards commercial vendors, they did not want uh, those commercial vendors to be like get bad rep, or maybe if some uh, some significant issue has been developed, uh, discovered to um, to to be affected, like security issue, or whatever. Uh, so not not of everything was uh, was uh, uh, was pushed uh, into open space, uh, which we also see as uh, as a little bit of uh, shortcoming, uh, and uh, something that we wanted to improve. And and, and then uh, the overall objective uh, of of this uh, of this endeavor uh, is to Basically, get together uh, as many open source uh, SIP implementation as we can um, for the for the duration of the event, and so test uh, new extensions and uh, 
perhaps if needed test uh, established implementations and features. Uh, obviously, for uh, for uh, anyone participating in this event, uh, uh, it, it it is great uh, great um, opportunity to find and fix bugs uh, and just to improve overall. Because because uh, as I said, no no implementation is perfect, uh, and uh, there is always uh, always something to fix. Um, and obviously, since we're talking about new standards and extensions. Uh, uh pe people who, teams who participate in this endeavor would uh would find uh areas that need additional work and it helps uh overall to uh kind of point development in the right uh, <clears throat> in the right direction and last but not least uh since uh, uh we're basically getting getting together uh quite uh quite uh significant number of people who do day-to-day uh, -day work in uh, implementing SIP. Uh, there is a lot of things you can learn and uh, just by interacting and uh, sharing the knowledge and have fun as well. Um, now, uh, the way we see this uh, organized was to, um, uh, to put everyone, uh, to, to get uh, several teams representing different different uh, projects uh, and and sometimes we might have uh, different teams representing same projects or uh, depending on circumstances but essentially we, we give uh, we give everyone uh, an instance in AWS uh, EC2 cloud and we set up uh, some uh, uh, private networks uh, between those uh, teams uh, to run uh, scenarios um, so th 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 that's kind of for the original idea and uh we, we as i said we it's been uh, in um, we've been thinking about this for um, for for a few years uh, since the last open secret and uh, i over the years i've spoken to some of the original uh, drivers be behind secret uh, original secret about uh doing something but nothing uh, nothing uh, was coming out so by talking to Giovanni and the open ships team we kind of uh, decided to do it and uh, again big thanks to open ships team uh, to letting us to collocate it last year in September along with uh, open ships summit distributed we did uh, I believe three days of uh, of uh, our uh, our uh, first uh, first event after after uh, all like main track of the conference uh, and and also great help from the CP software team uh, Alex Pyle and Andre also helped me a lot uh, on that um, and anyway we we managed to apart from open SIPs uh, as I said uh, they didn't uh, did good. Um, I uh, got pretty excited and uh, joined uh, our effort. We also managed to uh, together some other projects uh, in the SIP area. So we got uh, some people with the free switch. Uh, it was uh, some people from our uh, own uh, open source projects, uh, CP. And then we had uh, Dractio uh, team represented uh, uh, but by Dave Horton, uh, and there was some Camellio fans uh, bringing up uh, uh, some of the Camellio uh, instances. And also, I, I should say, uh, uh, big thanks to Enable Security and Sandro. Uh, they've been pretty, pretty, pretty uh, interested uh, to get involved. Uh, and for for the format, uh, we we did. Uh, we did try to replicate uh, kind of original event in, in a way. So basically, we set up uh, live YouTube meetings, uh, uh, sorry, Google meetings, and uh, stream it on YouTube. Uh, we basically get everyone for three hours uh, and did, did some uh, interrupts. So so to, to get started, we pick, uh, pick up uh, two particular uh, well one is one rfc the other one is set of rfc so basically uh, 
decided to look at the RFC 8760, uh, which adds uh, much needed uh, improvement in uh, in the digest uh, digest uh, algorithms uh, for the uh, hip digest authentication. Uh, and also it was uh, pretty new at the time. I believe it was uh, approved uh, last year in about April or May time. And, and also we've seen uh, quite a lot of uh, lot of interest in stir shaking, which, which was also kind of uh, shaping up. Uh, so we also wanted to do something about this. Uh, overall, uh, the first event was, or how we call it, a pilot, uh, that's why zero, zero. Uh, uh, it, it, it went uh, okay. We've seen, uh, we've seen, um, We've seen some uh, implementations of RFC 8760. Uh, we brought some of them ourselves. And what's more important, uh, we've seen uh, quite uh, good involvement from uh, from the people involved. Uh, in particular, Dave Horton. Uh, I believe he pretty much coded uh, coded it between one first day and second day in his directio, and, and also. So some other people, uh, I, I believe, uh, enable security brought implementation uh, from the grounds up, uh, and and uh, as as we expected, we found quite a lot of bugs and uh, and in um, in all of those, and then uh, we we tried to do stir shaking, uh, although at first at first uh, we did not uh, get too far. Uh, I mean, um, it's pretty pretty complicated set of protocols. So we basically uh, learned a lot in the process. As I said, uh, some uh, some heroes of the our pilot event uh, is Dave Horton. Livio Kirku was also great um, great help. Uh, it got he got pretty uh, pretty excited and uh, helped a lot. And as I already mentioned. Uh, Sandra Gauci uh, did a good uh, good involvement, uh, uh, which we did not really expect. Um, anyway, uh, af after that initial uh, initial event, uh, we decided to uh, that it definitely worthwhile. Uh, so we wanted um, to make something bigger and better. Uh, so after after a few months uh, thinking about it, uh, we did a little bit of uh, revision of the of the event flow. So now instead of uh, getting everyone together for uh, for three hours on uh, on the meeting room, uh, we did uh, we did we did structure it as a, a start day with the live session uh, around thirty minutes, and and then move everyone to uh, Slack channels. And continue uh, doing interrupts uh, using Slack as a communication mechanism, and then at the end of the day, we do uh, we do a closing session. Uh, also, on the event organization side, we got uh, we got David Daffet uh, who kind of approached me and uh, uh, got interested, offered his help with doing uh, PR marketing side of things, and he's been pretty instrumental in um, getting uh, more teams um, uh, to participate because what what what, uh, what we did not foresee at the beginning perhaps is that it takes quite a lot of time to uh, first uh, find uh, as a good time for every every team to maximize every team chance to participate because obviously if we're talking about six seven or eight uh, open source projects all of, all of those have uh, their own schedules they have their own conferences uh, you know product releases whatever and uh, it it, uh, it gets uh, gets quite uh, quite difficult to please everyone on top of it obviously there is a little bit of politics and this and that uh, I would not go into much detail so it um, but it also takes um, quite a lot of time. Uh, another thing that we uh, we did uh, we did try to organize is instead of uh, for, for the first event, essentially uh, we, we had organizers uh, to chair the whole uh, 
the whole uh, event. Uh, instead of doing that, uh, we decided to pick uh, or uh, ask people to self uh, self uh, volunteer uh, to uh, to uh, lead each session. So in 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 and steer it um, going forward. And and um, basically that's. Uh, uh, that worked pretty well. Uh, so, so now on the team side, we we did again uh, open SIPs uh, continued good involvement. Uh, th then we got uh, proper free switch uh, team. Uh, uh, we got uh, three engineers, I believe, committed from uh, free switch side to participate. We got team from Asterisk, uh, and we got team from Camellio as well. Uh, and then obviously we continued with the CP. Uh, SIP wishes uh, uh, got in continued involvement uh, and uh, we also got a uh, new uh, new kid on the block, uh, SIP front, Andreas Granin, who got uh, also pretty excited in, uh, in, uh, in taking part not only on uh, Camellio side of things, but also on his, uh, with his SIP front offering. Uh, Again, uh, big uh, big shout out to Liv Kirku. Uh, we almost uh, <laughs> got desperate with the stir shaking. Uh, there was uh, some some shaky things with the original uh, team lead uh, for the for the track. Uh, but uh, Liv went up and uh, uh, went on and stepped up to to lead the session, and he did a great job. Uh, uh, it's uh, yeah, if there are some links, uh, you guys, if you're curious uh, to learn about stir shaking, I would definitely recommend you watching his uh, open secret presentation. It's all, as I mentioned, it's all on, on YouTube, and uh, you can always uh, uh, look at it. Yeah, we we did uh, again. We did quite uh, quite good um, quite good uh, on. Uh, on the goals, uh, RFC 8760 got uh, quite a lot of improvement uh, since uh, our pilot event. We've seen uh, more implementations uh, being brought up. Uh, again, some of implementation were uh, made on uh, <clears throat> on the spot, uh, and uh, we also made uh, a few more bug fixes and improvements. Uh, and also, also leave you help help me to to merge uh, to merge it into the open sip smile line so so you guys should be should be able to test it uh, on, or get used some use of it uh, pretty much uh, uh, immediately now and then on steer shaking uh, with uh, with now with a little bit of more uh, preparation uh, we put a little bit more effort in uh, in learning and uh, educating ourselves uh, about particulars uh, of that uh, of that RFCs, uh, we've seen uh, quite a lot of uh, improvement and progress uh, made both uh, before the event and during the event uh, itself. Uh, so that, that was uh, at least a partial success uh, on that, that end. And last but not least, uh, on the security side, uh, uh, enable security and Sandro, in particular, did, did a great job. Uh, if um, uh, if you're curious, you can uh, check uh, check uh, pretty good. He did a pretty good uh, uh, postmortem write up of uh, uh, what's been going on on. Um, on the open sip at uh, 0.1 in terms of security and uh, uh, stir shaking testing. Now, now on the on the organizational side of things, I think uh, the uh, the uh, revised uh, structure of, of event uh, worked pretty well. We've seen very good activity on on the Slack channels. Uh, there was a uh, about uh, 14 uh, people actively participated uh, from all teams, and we've seen uh, about 2,000 messages uh, being posted over the course of just a few days. Uh, 
So that definitely, definitely worked well. Uh, on top of it, uh, we we organized several uh, uh, channels, uh, so we could uh, we could basically proceed with. Uh, since we had uh, quite a lot of teams uh, in uh, in the same room, we, we've been able to um, uh, kind of paralyze it uh, by uh, having those uh, specific channels for for specific testings. Uh, subsections. Uh, then another interesting uh, thing uh, that that, um, that we've seen uh, uh, after the event, uh, the, some of the some of the discussions uh, continued uh, uh, well past uh, past uh, the event end. Uh, so it, it, there are some uh, people working. Obviously, as, as the event ended, people uh, continued working on implementations uh, improving and there are some questions or uh, some unclear things that uh, got discussed uh, on uh, on the channels after after the events and uh, all this uh, as I said is uh, is available online so if um, if any of you is curious so uh, uh, very well uh, welcome to go and uh, take a peek at the at the, at the available, uh, it's all available on the internet. So, so now uh, to to give a brief uh, summary of what we kind of where we are at the moment. Um, so, proof of concept, uh, I think, uh, has worked pretty well uh, last year. Uh, and then uh, this year we did uh, we did. Uh, focus uh, on uh, overall process improvements uh, and uh, uh, being able to scale it up uh, we did not uh, we did not try to kind of overachieve so we, we see that uh, we should uh, we should uh, view the results uh, as uh, as just uh, some hints for further improvement although as I said uh, we've seen that we've seen that ourselves and also, uh, we spoke to some of the teams uh, after the event, uh, and we heard people speaking on the conferences. I believe uh, everyone involved got uh, uh, got quite excited and uh, found the event as a pretty useful endeavor. Uh, so, so uh, in the, in that regard, we are uh, continue. We hope to continue doing this. Uh, in the future, uh, now we're thinking about organizing uh, uh, one more of those, probably in uh, late October, November. Again, uh, depending on uh, on uh, on the schedules and uh, overall uh, interest. And go going forward, uh, we we hope to do two to three online events uh, per year as a baseline. Uh, there are also some uh, some discussion about uh, doing this uh, in person at some point, uh, but uh, we all know the uh, particulars of that, and uh, so we'll see how it develops, situation develops. But uh, definitely uh, would be would be an interesting uh, uh, things to do at some point. Uh, uh, fingers crossed. Um, yeah, again, a uh, little bit more about uh, CPIT 2 plans uh, for the next uh, open CPIT. And again, this is uh, this is more uh, call for uh, for input, I believe, uh, or uh, request for comments, uh, because we are we're, uh, we hope at least to, to be driven by a community at some point. So we basically want to see the same RFCs uh, because. Uh, Obviously, they are far from from being fully done. Uh, we want to see stir shaking RFC 87, 60, and also we hope uh, to see continuing uh, involvement from uh, from enable security uh, in particular, and as a, hopefully at some point maybe even other security people uh, in that. Uh, oh, but also there is a, there is a a uh, great deal of discussion going on to also bring uh, some traffic capture dissection tools for this. And then, and speaking of that, well, we kind of did uh, actually inadvertent, inadvertently, we already did uh, 
did some interop on that. Uh, I believe on uh, on the on the pilot event or on the first event, uh, Liviu has uh, has bumped into some uh, some uh, some crashes in uh, in one of the cap cap packet capture tools that he used. So so uh, there's definitely interesting area. So definitely if uh, if you if you listen to this presentation, your your tool is uh, some has to do something with the PyCat capture in SIP area. Uh, let us know. We would definitely uh, love to see more people, uh, more teams participating on that end. And then uh, there are some other interesting RFCs that at some point uh, uh, we would like to get uh, um, get uh, looked at. Uh, in particular, some of the recent ones like. Uh, uh, Java Web Tokens uh, or uh, CPREC, uh, which we we heard some presentations uh, in the past few days. And, and again, uh, it's uh, it's always uh, work in progress for us. And uh, so, if you have um, some particular, if your project or your organization has some particular RFC um, that you feel like uh, needs uh, some attention, let us know. We definitely would consider it. Now, now um, as I said, we, see, we definitely see it, um, see, still see the need as to, to get more people involved in the organization uh, because it's, uh, as, as we learned in, uh, in our pilot event and our uh, subsequent event, uh, for, uh, for one person or two person, or even three persons, it's, it's quite difficult um, uh, to prepare uh, everything, even uh, even to get uh, to understand uh, uh, like what the, how to test particular RFC takes non-trivial amount of time. Uh, so so if uh, if you feel like uh, you want to get involved and you have uh, some interest on your qualification on. Uh, on any of those or other RFCs, uh, let us know. Uh, and also, it's a great opportunity if if you see uh, some particular need uh, for particular RFC to get adapted quicker than uh, rather than slower. Uh, also, might be a good um, good venue uh, to get involved. That's that's actually prove I, I proved it a little bit by myself. Uh, in a way, because for the for the for the pilot event, I essentially did um, one of the first open source implementation of RFC 8760 in, in our Python B2BA uh, stack, uh, and then we used it as a as a kind of uh, reference to to work on open SIPs implementation, which I brought uh, uh, brought to test, uh, and Livio helped me. Uh, to test it and uh, later merged, and and then uh, we it stirred uh, in interest, and and we've seen uh, uh, like definitely a lot of improvement just by uh, by doing open it in uh, overall uh, RFC 8760 readiness uh, among open source projects. Maybe not right now, but obviously it's all implemented in uh, in the development versions. But it's, uh, at some point, it will it will get to productions as well. Uh, and then, uh, if your commercial vendor were uh, pretty open to to have your product uh, presented and tested uh, against open source implementation, uh, obviously we still try to keep uh, keep it um, our open source goal. And uh, it's mostly going to be about open source projects, uh, but uh, on uh, uh, on the side uh, we can also leverage uh, some of the some of um, some of the expertise we have. And uh, also for uh, for commercial vendors, we see we see it as a as a pretty good uh, opportunity because essentially. Uh, whenever you develop a commercial product uh, in these days in, and you put it into the field, it's most likely it's going to be talking to uh, all of those open source implementations uh, at some point. 
So we probably might be interested in getting tested it uh, beforehand. Um, with, and and uh, obviously, since we have uh, pretty much uh, teams from all of those open source uh, projects organized in the same room, uh, it, it, you don't need even to learn uh, any particulars of uh, particular implementation. So we see it as a good, good opportunity. Um, and, and again, if even if you don't um, don't feel like uh, uh, getting uh, getting uh, too involved, uh, there are other other ways you can help. Uh, so obviously, share, like, and subscribe. As I said, we we try to publish everything uh, either on YouTube or on other social medias uh, as much as possible. Uh, there are some technical work which right now is done by uh, CP software team uh, and again that's great help uh, but also if we're always open uh, to have somebody else to help us uh, with that uh, and, and as I mentioned uh, if you're open source team and you have some RFCs uh, uh, come over and uh, get it tested uh, there are some ways to support it there will be some links uh, to patreon uh, channel um, and uh, yeah all that stuff um yeah i guess uh, that's um uh, finishing a little bit earlier but um at some contacts uh and i'm happy to take some questions uh, now Thank you, Max. I, I just wanted to jump in for a minute and uh, just echo what Max was saying about involvement. That is absolutely key. And and I wouldn't say that people were exactly sceptical about it, but what I would say is that people only realised how valuable it was when they actually got involved and got their hands dirty with it. And uh, in the last one, OpenCipit 01, where we had the free switch team, the Asterisk team, the Kama Ilio team, the Open SIPs team, of course, who played a very uh, major part. Um, that was uh, really valuable stuff, wasn't it, Max? And we could see the the happiness on the faces of the participants as they uh, got stuck in and saw, you know, various things getting uncovered in their individual projects. And I think everybody would say that it helped move their individual projects projects forwards in in handling the things that we looked at. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, well. Um, one thing about this event, it's no, Max. Before Max, before answering, let me let me do a small addition to what David uh, just uh, said. Uh, I think at the end, uh, the final, uh, let's say, winner of this uh, uh, kind of tests uh, are not necessarily the developers behind the projects, but actually the users behind the projects, because at the end, at the end of the day, in the real world. The user are the ones, let's say, fighting all the interops problems and trying to solve, uh, you know, uh, putting together software A and software B. You know, the um, the developers are just the the middle uh, the middlemen, just making it possible, fixing it. But again, the benefit on it's on uh, the final benefit it's on the user side. Yeah, yeah, I I, I could not disagree with that. I I think it's uh, pretty much everyone's benefit. Uh, in one way or another i mean uh, developers obviously care about their uh, products they want it to be like as good as possible right because we're all, uh, we're all proud of our work uh, and we want it uh, and then uh, coming to end users obviously those are people who are uh, mostly suffering from uh, <laughs> all, uh, all uh, interop problems and everything like that yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the other thing i wanted to say uh, before we continue, and I'm sure uh, Alex in his MC role will thank you for the talk. But Max, although it's a, a, everybody knows it's a team effort, I wanted to say a big thank you to you on behalf of everybody for have it, having the heart to kind of drive this forward. So thank you very much for actually pushing things forward. Well done, Max. And uh, I have a question too. Um, in the history of uh, OpenCPIT uh, and then uh, uh, this uh, new one and the interop before, 
what was uh, the main uh, uh, stumbling block uh, or uh, main problems uh, in uh, interoperability uh, as you see uh, evolving uh, during the years? Uh, for sure, uh, uh, right now is uh, like uh, still shaken. Uh, uh, etc. But uh, I'm um, I'm more interested in the historical point of view, uh, how it developed. Uh, I imagine that, that it was probably presence, but uh, I, I leave to you to describe it. Yeah, thanks, Giovanni. Um, well, well, yes, I guess uh, pretty much any any sufficiently complicated RFC is. Uh, it's difficult in, in one, one way or another. Uh, and another thing that uh, what is uh, what is kind of what we saw as a problem is a lack of um, coordination, right? There is a, there is always like uh, everybody is waiting on everybody else. So to, uh, by just talking to um, talking to people about getting involved in open secret, uh, uh some people just say, "Oh, this feature is nobody asks us." Like uh, nobody asks us for, uh, I don't know, SHA, SHA, SHA method in authentication. Like, and, and we, we, for that reason, we don't we don't want to work on it because nobody is paying for us, paying us to do this work. Uh, so, I don't know. It's kind of chicken and egg in some way, I guess, uh, for the interop, at least. But yeah, presence is probably is still difficult. I guess uh, <laughs> we're not we're not even brave to test it. <laughs> uh, but uh, look, uh, even at the and shaken that were you know tests which were done uh, quite uh, uh, recently, and uh, if you think about uh, from a C perspective, it's more or less not much it's just a header so the implication over the zip traffic it's small but uh, even if the rfc tries to cover to uh, you know uh, to i mean to leverage how it should be done all the time there is so much um, uh, space for interpretations you know on uh, what the rfc says uh, but remember that uh, recently uh, they uh, we we had to do some change on the steering shaken because on how the time actually uh, is extracted from the message. I mean, uh, there is a bit fuzzy in the RFC and uh, it may be interpreted in several ways. And once, uh, you know, uh, some, uh, again, for interoperability issues, um, you need to be, how to say, more loose in terms of following what the RFC says, because, well, you need to be in the middle between what the RFC uh, says and what actually the other players on, uh, you know, in the SIP uh, are doing, because, you know, you want at the end of the day to work. You know, yeah, so, you, uh, they, they say accept broadly and send uh, uh, very strict. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Something but like there this. Is, there is also a balance in that, right? Because if you're, uh, if you're, uh, as they also said, you should not be as open-minded, uh, so your your brain falls out, right? So, so it's the same goes probably. <laughs> same I goes haven't heard that one, but I'm going to use it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it, uh, striking this balance is probably pretty, pretty big chunk of uh, of work because obviously you want to have something implemented in fin finite amount of time, and sometimes those RFCs are so detailed they go into like very very weird use cases uh, where you never end uh, you usually in like working in uh, in real world so yeah, and, and this max was something that we found wasn't it because it was one thing to actually get things working and interoperating together but it's another thing for them to be robust in handling exceptions and not breaking yeah yeah exactly and then there is always uh, implementation bias. Uh, usually, what what happens when you're uh, working in in our area, at least you test it with your own implementation, right? So if you're implementing, for example, uh, digest authentication method server, you, you test it against your client or uh, other way around. Uh, and then if you're if you're the same person working on both. Uh, uh, 
you most likely to implement uh, it in a way that it works with itself. Uh, but uh, it's much more, uh, no, not much, but it's still diff diff different uh, when you bring it with uh, independent implementation. The, the other thing this we is the, found the really... nice thing of uh, working with uh, WebRTC that uh, you control the client. <laughs> Uh, I also wanted to mention there was such a high level of enthusiasm during and after the event that people actually carried on doing stuff, you know, after OpenSippet officially closed, people were still exchanging messages and testing things out. So it was really positive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, at some point there, is, uh, there was some suggestion to, to do it uh, more like on a regular basis. Um, but, but, but again, we're a pretty small team, so for us it's... Uh, it's a little bit challenging at the moment, but who knows? At some point, we might uh, we might organize something on those slides as well. Great. So we have about four more minutes left here before our next presentation. Do we have any other questions for Max? I'm just checking the Slack channel, see if there's anything there. In the meantime, uh, uh, maybe Max uh, can can tell us about uh, some uh, lateral things, uh, but uh, what's uh, what's in the future uh, for uh, the, the, the open source products uh, he is famous uh, for, uh, both uh, RTP proxy and uh, uh, B2B uh, from CP? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, thanks, Giovanni. Um, well, we continue maintaining RTP proxy. Uh, as as uh, spoke to Razvan about it a few times, uh, the, the prob not the problem, the issue uh, with that project is that we don't we don't see a lot of open source community involvement. Uh, I mean, we we, we did have um, we did have some help from uh, Voice Center, and Razvan is uh, is also. Uh, Given us some hand in implementing some stuff, uh, so we definitely would like to see more people getting getting involved, uh, and we're not abandoning those projects. Uh, in terms of uh, CP B2B, we're, uh, we're we're trying to release uh, release our code um, and keep it updated uh, with the latest development, uh, so that that's all going live and well. Uh, but, but again, we're uh, trying to sit on so many, so many <laughs> chairs, and sometimes it's getting, getting a little bit difficult uh, to manage. You hear uh, that, people? Yeah, yeah. On the other end, we also, we also get getting, uh, getting, uh, getting involved in some, uh, some more infrastructure projects in terms of, for example. We saw there is a problem uh, with that uh, uh, continuous integration setup last year with open ships. So basically I stepped in and helped them to move from, uh, what was the name of that CI system? Uh, Travis? Yeah, 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 Travis. Uh, so essentially, if you guys don't hear the story, Travis was one of the first CI systems that, that kind of came up and offered uh, uh, open source uh, people free free lunch essentially free time on their service, but at some point they got f f kind of uh, I think they got bought and they tried to convert it into more uh, profitable model. So they basically kept everyone uh, open source wise on very very low number of hours. <laughs> this essentially brought uh, brought everything to halt essentially in the first uh, one. Of Two days of billion cycle. So, so essentially, yeah, we had to. Um, I personally spent quite a lot of time uh, moving that stuff over. And uh, but, I mean, okay. Well, on that moment of silence, we're gonna start our next transition here. Um, we're gonna be bringing you um, a talk here shortly. Uh, from Jonathan Abrams from NextPath Networks. He's going to be ta talking to you about tackling big telco data volumes with ClickHouse, an open source column store database. And as Jonathan is getting ready, I'm going to turn this over to my esteemed colleague, 
Mr. Bogdan. Um, he has a little information about what's going on with the uh, latest on the fundraiser. Bogdan, are you there? Yes, I am. And uh, let me uh, bring to you the news on the la latest, uh, how to say, under the table arrangements, which are done in uh, in regards to uh, to the fundraising. Uh, I just uh, received a very interesting proposal from uh, from Voice Center from uh, from uh, Shlomi uh, Gutman. He said, "Okay, let's make a deal. Let's make actually a bet. Like we fill in, like Voice Center and uh, OpenSip Solutions, we fill in uh, the um, uh, two thousand dollars out of the roughly, I think, four thousand six hundred remaining, and uh, yeah, uh, let's uh, make this as a challenge." For everybody else to fill in the remaining roughly 2,600, with uh, having in mind that by Friday was completely completely done. So we together are willing to put the two uh, 2,000 there, uh, and um, uh, in order to win this bet that the whole uh, fundraising is completed by the end of uh, of the summit. Uh, we need the help of the community to come up with the remaining 2,600. So let's see if we manage to win this bet. Uh, uh, but uh, so far, uh, great uh, thanks to Voice Center and uh, Shlomi Goodman for uh, oh, for their uh, support here. All right. Oh, well, well, on the end, I, I have a little announcement that I, I did not did not put it into my presentation, but. Um, on, with my CP software head on, uh, we also decided to put a thousand dollars in into that campaign. Whoa, whoa, whoa! whoa <laughs> we are almost getting closer and closer. Thank you, Max. <laughs> wow! So now the balance is one thousand six hundred. Am I that correct, Bogdan? Uh, yes, yes, you are. Okay, so literally, what we need to do between now and Friday is reach deeper. I mean. Everybody, if you go to church, it's just like that dish that goes around. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> we really need you to dig deep, everyone. We need $1,600 to finish this out so that we can take money out of open sips and voice center's pockets. I love this. I, I, no I, noticed, <laughs> I noticed that there's nearly 240 members on Summit Chat. So if everybody put about $7 or something, my math isn't that good. But... It would be a small amount for everybody in the summit chat. That's seven dollars, people. Reach into your PayPal, grab your credit cards, head over to GoFundMe. Let's get this done. Okay, so we'll be pressuring you in about an hour, just after Mr. Abrams finishes his presentation. We've held him up long enough with peddling our our fundraiser. Uh, Jonathan, are you with us? Uh, I think so. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. And we could see your presentation. Yes, the floor is yours, sir. Okay. Well, this is a presentation about tackling telco data with ClickHouse. Um, all pretty much everything we do generates a lot of data. So this is a powerful tool that can help you solve a lot of problems. Okay. Just for some background, who am I? I've been doing this for about 20 years. Started out in 2001. Uh, we were doing retail and wholesale calling card in tandem. In those days, TDM on Lucent Excel, EXS2000 programmable switches. Uh, Oracle database was all the rage then. Um, I've primarily worked all with small companies, so I've been involved in the switching, the operations, the financial aspects. Um, and basically from there, I've learned quite a bit and been forced to learn quite a bit. Um, and I've, as a consultant, been able to successfully migrate many customers from um, existing systems that are either untenable or financially unviable to more uh, open and maintainable uh, solutions. As far as ClickHouse, well, what is ClickHouse? It's an open source, high performance column store database. It has a SQL front end, so it's you know very similar to running queries that say in MySQL or Postgres or Oracle. Uh, it was developed by Yandex. I'm assuming pretty much everybody in this audience knows who Yandex is. Um, they open sourced it back in 2016. Uh, it's written in C++, very clean code, very well laid out. 
Um, it uses a column store layout storage, um, which if you're not familiar with what that is, you know, a traditional database, your Oracle, your InnoDB tables in MySQL, Postgres, they use row-based storage. So basically all the data for the row is stored row by row. So you got a row, 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 row. And a column store, they kind of rotate this 90 degrees and all the column data for each column is stored with just that column's other data. So you got column, 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 column. And that allows uh, basically ClickHouse to do things in a lot more efficient manner uh, for most big operations on big tables. Um, so it's getting into what it's specifically good at, and that's of course storing lots of data. I found basically you're getting into the tens of millions of rows a month of, of data being generated. Uh, column store database can make your life a lot easier. Uh, your query is a lot snappier and allow you to do things that you wouldn't normally be able to do with a row store. Um, I'm primarily using it for ad hoc queries um, and then statistical analysis on a regular basis for robocall mitigation and traffic profile uh, management. It excels at um, aggregate OLAP queries on big tables. So, you know, your sums, um, your counts, that kind of thing. Um, it is structured data only pretty much. Um, you've got to define your columns up front. Um, I've got semi in there because it does support JSON columns. It does support arrays and dictionaries. So there's some, some stuff where you can sneak in some non-structured data in there. Um, it also supports time series data very well. It wasn't designed for time series data, um, but it's, you know, they've added some codecs and encodings that make it very, very efficient for time series data. And it's competitive with, you know, your, your special purpose built uh, database basis, timescale DB, influx DB, that kind of stuff. Um, it's very efficient. You can run fast queries on reasonably powerful hardware. Um, I've, most of my customers aren't blessed with much of a budget, so I'm running on mostly old DDR3 E5 Xeon. So you've got those collecting desks or, you know, browsing, pursue, uh, browsing eBay. You can, you know, find those for a couple hundred bucks, slap some disk in there, slap, you know, 64 gigs of memory, and you've got a really powerful machine to do queries on. Um, because of the column store, um, there's not a lot of random IO, so it actually performs quite well in platter storage. Um, so like archival becomes very, very useful with ClickHouse. Um, with the compression and the platter storage, you can store, you know, terabytes of data very, very, very cheaply. I mean, object storage, when you get into the multiples of terabytes, it starts adding up on a monthly basis. Uh, it's also very flexible at interacting with outside data sources. Um, you can integrate with, with you know, MySQL, Postgres, uh, Kafka, RabbitMQ. Um, it's just really, really easy to integrate with existing infrastructure. Uh, it also supports replication and distributed queries. So you can you know, automatically add replication. Um, you can scale out your queries. It, it shards the data. So if you know if you want to stick with your E5s and don't want to scale vertically, you can scale them out horizontally. As far as what it's not good at, well, OLTP. I mean, it's, it's, ClickHouse is not good for manipulating individual rows. There's no you know, row-specific indexes, so point queries are, are poor. It doesn't handle small insert batches well. It'll do it. It's just not efficient at it. Um, you don't want to store your user location or aliases table in ClickHouse. Um, it doesn't support ACID, so, you know, there's no transactions, no rollbacks, no guaranteed consistency, there's no foreign keys, um, no constraints, unique keys, that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, you don't, you, you're not going to use it for traditional relational database work. Um, they're work, trying to work around some of these, but in general, you know, use MySQL, Oracle, Postgres for that kind of stuff. Um, it's not you know, not suitable for a key value store. Again, it'll work as a key value store, but you know performance is going to suffer compared to a, a specifically designed key store database. Um, as far as usage scenarios, like I said, yeah, CDR storage it, it really really excels at this for reporting and analysis. Um, I mean, we're, compared to let's say a traditional row da row oriented database, I mean, I'm talking two three orders of magnitude speed ups in some cases. In some cases it'll just never finish on a row store. 
Um, it's great for archival, again, platter storage, um, great compression. Um, it, you know, it, it can be really, if you're on a budget, it's much, much cheaper than, you know, hosting it in the cloud and object storage. As far as, um, you know, other things you can do with it, it since it has ClickHouse, or, or sorry, since ClickHouse has um, Kafka and RabbitMQ integration, you can actually stream data into ClickHouse. And then from there, you can ha use materialized view to aggregate and transform this data and then put it into different tables, which then you can use to uh, query on for alarming and you can do dashboarding. There's Grafana integration, so it's very, very easy to do dashboarding straight from Grafana right into ClickHouse. Um, there's also, it's been playing around lately with SIP capture storage. I'm not an expert on that. Uh, Quick SIP is the people you wanna to talk to as far as SIP capture storage and ClickHouse. But again, it's, it's another thing, um, you know, you're storing a lot of data, yeah, ClickHouse excels at that. As far as tools and integrations, how, how do you use it on a daily basis? Um, there's an excellent um, command line client, ClickHouse CLI. There's also a HTTP server built in that you can use to do interactive queries with it. Um, I use JetBrains Data Grip, which is a commercial package. Um, it's excellent. You know, it's not terribly expensive and works with pretty much all your other databases as well. If you're going to use ClickHouse, I highly recommend checking that out. Visualization, of course, there's Grafana, there's Apache Superset, Looker, Redash, Cabex. Um, and really over the last year and a half, um, the amount of integrations has exploded um, to where, you know, um, everything's starting to support ClickHouse in the commercial or even open source realm. Getting down to like the nuts and bolts, um, as far as storing stuff in ClickHouse, ClickHouse supports many different types of table engines. Uh, for local and native storage, Merge Tree is pretty much the one you're always going to use. Um, it's a, based on LSM trees, kind of like RocksDB. Um, it was originally immutable, but they say since made it so you can do updates and deletes thanks to GDPR. Um, other specialized implementations of Merge Trees are there. Um, most interesting one is the summing merge tree, but there's a whole bunch of other ones that Yandex came up with to solve specific problems they were having. You can also store data externally. Um, you can use S3 or HDFS. I think there's a uh, there's a paper out there by Altinity talking about performance on S3, and it actually looks quite good. Uh, so there's another option if you want to archive data and make it searchable in an inexpensive manner. Okay, as far as what you can store, I mean, it's the usual stuff. You got your integers, your floating points, your fixed point, booleans, strings, date, times. Um, there's also arrays, tuples, maps, and enums. Um, you can do some really cool stuff with the arrays and tuples that you would normally need a stored procedure or you would need a, you know, a, a normal outside program to do. Um, ClickHouse supports nulls. It wasn't originally in there, so there's still a few places where nulls are kind of awkward. Um, mostly nowadays in the create table syntax, but outside of that, it, it's fairly seamless. Okay, this is where things really get interesting with ClickHouse, and it's the encodings and compression. Each column in ClickHouse can have its own encoding and compression scheme. So you can, you know, you can tailor the codec, uh, the codec and compression um, to the data you're trying to store and, you know, how you need to retrieve it. Um, you can use the codings and the compression together and it further shrinks down. Uh, to, in a lot of cases, there's a lot of columns that become almost free. I mean, we're talking fractions of a byte. So, you know, there's not any reason not to store them. So you don't really need to normalize your data unless you really have to. Um, it, so it becomes very, very easy to do analytical queries because all your data is there in the table and you don't need to do joins and that kind of stuff. Um, as far as the encodings, there's three main types. Uh, there's delta and double delta. It encodes the delta between the within the column between the previous and next entries. I think ADPCM, um, you know, from the TDM world. Um, it's great for dates, times. I mean, you can if the dates your dates and times are in order, it'll shrink it down to next to nothing. You know, fractions of a byte. Um, you can then, of course, apply compression on top of that. There's a kind of unique gorilla encoding 
I've never really used it, but it basically, from what I can tell, encodes delta, the delta from a, a mean. Um, I guess the best example I can think of is auto dialer traffic durations. You know, everything's around 12 seconds, give or take a few seconds. Um, and that can compress that kind of data. My favorite of the encodings is the T64. And that basically gives you an auto sizing integer column. Uh, let's say you need to store a, you know, a values up to a million, you would normally need to use a 32 bit column. So four bytes. Um, but you know, really, realistically, you're only going to use 20 bits. Uh, so the T64 will, you know, analyze the data in the column and the chunk of the column, decide, you know, see how many bits you're using, and they'll strip off the unused bits. So instead of needing 32 bits to store that, you know, values up to a million, you're down to 20 bits. And then again, you compress on top of this, you get a lot of integer columns that become, you know, almost free from a storage perspective. Um, there's my other favorite is low column cardinality. It's kind of a, a special column storage type. Uh, it creates an automatic enum. There is a specific enum um, data type in ClickHouse, but you have to predefine the enum beforehand. Um, so it doesn't scale well just from a management perspective. Well, the low cardinality will create the dictionary on the fly um, for the enums. And that way, basically, you don't have to do any upfront work. I mean, not only does this improve the storage efficiency, again, with compression on top of it, um, but it also provides a performance boost as well, so long as you don't have too many values. I think uh, 10K and under, you get a boost, 10K to 100K, it's a break even. Um, and above that, you start to get a, a degradation in performance. Um, this is great for you know storing your country names, you know, LURG data, you know, rate centers, LATA OCNs, um, even the LRNs, you get a you get a storage savings boost because it's only 50, 60k in North America. Um, customer and vendor names, you know, all things that you might otherwise um, do a join to get from metadata, you can store very, very cheaply. Column compression, um, there's three supported out of the box, uh, LZ4, LZ4, high, high compression, and Z standard. Um, LZ4 is the default, works pretty well. Uh, the HC version will give you more compression at the penalty of encoding time. Um, so it takes more CPU to, to compress it, but it's the same after you, after you compress it as far as decompressing it. Uh, Z standard then will give you more compression um, but again, there's a penalty, not just for the compression, but also the decompression as far as CPU usage. Um, but it really makes a huge difference on columns that are real random. Let's say your call IDs or your calling and calling numbers, um, where LZ4 just you know, doesn't give you great results. Um, I found like for CDR data, you can get, you can get your ClickHouse storage down to what a gzip flat file would be. Um, so again, great for archival it, it basically you get fully searchable and there's really no overhead as far as the internal structures i mean here's some actual example of of rows from a live data set um this is about a 1.2 billion rows um the call id is is basically the the biggest space users 68 gigs uh, for a billion rows but you know it's 11 bytes per row on average um and you could see though you know going you're calling and call number take a lot but you go down to let's say at the bottom um some flag columns eight bit flag columns the call direction short duration um it compresses those downs to a 20th of a byte uh for so you know we're talking a few hundred megs for over a billion rows i mean they're basically at that point free um if you're looking at this end time which is a, a date time 64 again that double delta you know, compresses that down to nothing. 300 megs, again, 1.2 billion rows, 20th of a byte per row. Uh, same thing with the Unix time, 64 bit Unix timestamp, a gig for a billion rows. Um, LURG, LURG data, um, customer names, again, byte, less than a byte per row. ClickHouse supports table partitioning, and this is really just there for management purposes. Since you're, if you're going to store a lot of data, um, deleting data is not quick. 
Um, but with the partitions, you can just drop, you can truncate them, you can attach them, move them to a different database, or you can run optimization um, commands on them individually. Um, ClickHouse provides you a lot of helper functions to, to do the partitioning. You can actually partition not just on a column, but a set of columns or even expressions in columns. And there's some helper functions like year, month, day, year, month, and two year that I generally use to partition by the start time or end time of the call, depending on the customer. Now, the primary keys in ClickHouse are a bit different than the primary key you're normally used to. Um, they're not unique. Uh, they don't actually point at any data. Um, it's basically a secondary index. Um, it's used as a skip index um, that kind of gives ClickHouse an idea of what's in that primary key so it can skip over it. And so if you're using a where clause with that primary key, it will significantly speed up um, searches within your data. Uh, I generally, since I'm generally using the end time or start time of a call, um, ClickHouse will store the ranges in a chunk of, of, of data. So basically it knows, you know, that within that chunk of data, there's, you know, these you know, start time and end time. And so any chunks of data for the start time column that fall outside of the range, it just ignores. So it quickly eliminate, eliminates data it needs to pull off a disk. And that, again, lack of IO, the lack of number crunching really speeds things up. Um, the other benefit is it's, it's very space efficient. It fits in memory unless you're, you know, really, really huge or poorly chosen key. Um, and so it, it becomes a almost free speed up tool. Here's kind of an example of what the OpenSIPS accounting table would look like if you were to do a crate table in ClickHouse. You know, it's, it's fairly standard crate table as compared to like MySQL or Oracle. Um, the only real difference you see is like the low column out of the, the codec, um, nullable, and then on the engine definitions at the bottom. Um, but otherwise it's, it's a fairly familiar syntax. Okay, getting on to skip indexes. They're basically secondary indexes in ClickHouse, and they're used to speed up your where clauses and speed up searching subsets of data. Um, again, these are not traditional indexes like you find in a normal row store database. They don't actually point to any rows. Um, they basically just give ClickHouse an idea what might exist in certain chunks of columns. Um, and so if, if when it's looking through a column and it's not in a, in a chunk, you know, it doesn't see those values within the secondary index within that column. It can, within that chunk of the column, it can then skip all the rows associated with that column data. Um, so it, it can it can really knock out um, I.O. that it doesn't need to do because it knows it's not there. You define skip indexes or secondary indexes on a per column basis. Um, so you can tailor that to those columns and what you need to get out of them and what you store. Um, and how fast you need to need to pull it out. Um, this gives you a lot of flexibility. You don't have to be at a secondary in index. ClickHouse doesn't do it automatically, except for the primary key. And this allows you, if you don't need to speed it up, you don't need to waste the storage for that secondary index. Okay, as far as skip index types, um, there's a min max, and that's good for, let's say numbers and date ranges. Um, ClickHouse, ClickHouse will, uh, store a uh, the minimum and maximum of a range for a, a, a chunk of a column. And again, if it's not within that range, ClickHouse will skip over that, that chunk of the column in associated rows. Uh, there's also a set where it'll store all the unique values kind of in the secondary index. And that speeds up, let's say, um, where clauses where you're using an in or has, that kind of thing. Uh, ClickHouse also provides a bloom filter uh, which you can use pretty much any column type. Um, if you don't know what a bloom filter is, it's a highly efficient data structure and it basically stores uh, information about sets, but specifically what's not in a set. Um, it can do this in a very space efficient manner. However, there is a, a chance of a false positive on whether something is in the set. Um, so therefore you can allocate more space and it'll be less likely to give you a false positive 
Um, but it's one of those things where you, you kind of have to have a trade off between um, between accuracy and storage. Um, but with with the bloom filter, you can really, really speed up uh, when you're looking for individual row, uh, rows of data because because the lack of lack of um, row specific indexes things looking up things like um, call IDs, uh, specific calling number, call number um, are generally fairly slow compared to a row store database with a good index. And the, the bloom filter support and ClickHouse gets around that. There's another specialized type of bloom filter called the token bloom filter. Uh, it's for tokens and strings. And so basically, if you're storing, let's say, tags or other delimited data in a column, um, you can use the bloom filter to speed up searches for finding rows that, that have this column containing whatever tags or, or tokens you want to look for. Uh, I don't use it so much in, in my purposes, but I would think for some other, other especially you know, web or cl um, click analysis, it'd be great. Uh, the most useful um, secondary index I found is the Ngram Bloom filter. Uh, it's designed specifically for strings. Um, it'll basically cut strings up into chunks, the n-grams. You can define, you know, how many, uh, how many characters you want to use in each n-gram. But this basically speeds up string searches in your where clauses. Uh, not just the equals, but the like, an n, or starts with and ends with. Um, you specify the size uh, of the bloom filter you want to use. And again, it's, it comes down to the trade-off of how accurate you want to be as far as false positives and how much extra space you want to store. Um, again, the place you really, really want to use this is, you know, if you were trying to search for call IDs or specific call numbers, um, uh, call and call, LRN, that kind of thing. Since there's, again, no row specific indexes, no B-tree indexes, um, this kind of gets around it. And if you size your, your, size your filter right, um, you can eliminate, you know, 90 plus percent of the, the rows and ClickHouse can just skip over all the data that doesn't contain what you're looking for. And, and basically you get rid of one of the Achilles heels of the column store database. I found basically with, you know, maybe five to, cent, five to 10 percent extra storage space over just the column data itself, um, you can speed things up by about 90, 95 percent as far as like looking for calling or call numbers. Um, as far as integrating ClickHouse with the outside data sources, um, ClickHouse really does play well with others. Um, it's really integrated into existing infrastructure. Um, it supports external dictionaries, proxy tables. You can query outside databases directly from SQL. Um, you can stream in data directly from Kafka and RabbitMQ. Um, like I said, this, that's really great for building real-time dashboards and other, other analysis work. Uh, it can also behave as a replication client to Postgres or MySQL. Uh, so basically, you know, like MySQL or Postgres, the, the binary logging logs will get shipped over ClickHouse, and it can use that to insert and alter the data in some cases. Um, looking at dictionaries, you can create dictionaries from local, local tables, uh, text files, or even external table engines. So let's say you got your call data. And ClickHouse, but you know your customer metadata is in MySQL. Um, you can use these dictionaries to do the lookup of the metadata, and with them being stored within Mary ClickHouse, uh, it basically gets rid of a need of a join. You're not using a join anymore. You're basically just using a function call um, to look up that data. Um, as additional help, the dictionaries can be auto refreshed at a time interval by ClickHouse. So, so long as your data is not changing every second, ClickHouse can, you know, go in there, let's say every five minutes and see if things change, uh, pull down the dictionary again, and then anything from then on, you have the latest data. There's also proxy table engines, and basically that's where you predefine um, outside tables, and then you map them to a ClickHouse table. So it looks like you're querying a local ClickHouse table, uh, but instead, ClickHouse will go pull in that data at query time, and then you can use that in your normal query crunching. It's, you know, normal create table syntax, just basically in, in the engine definition, you're given the login information and the table name. As far as ad hoc external queries, this is 
one of my favorite features of ClickHouse because it makes data analysis between multiple data sources really, really easy. I mean, you can basically query external tables and other databases uh, directly from your SQL query. You don't need to predefine them. You basically, instead of using the table name, you use, you use the function name, let's say MySQL or Postgres. Um, you know, makes it really, really great for analysis work where you got data in a whole bunch of different data stores and you don't want to have to pull them all into one place just to be able to do your analysis queries. Um, again, it's just, you know, instead of the table name, you're putting in MySQL and you're giving parameters as to what the login information and table name is. Kafka and Rabbit MQ streaming. Um, again, this is a really, really powerful tool here. Um, it basically allows ClickHouse to be a consumer of Kafka and Rabbit Q, or Rabbit MQ. Um, Rabbit Q MQ is already there with Click uh, with uh, Open SIPs, um, so you can take things straight from the Rabbit MQ straight from the Open SIPs. Um, once ClickHouse pulls that in, you can create materialized view that will automatically um, take that data as it's streamed in. And you can transform, you can aggregate it, and then put the data in other tables. You can create multiple materialized views for different kinds of views of the data as it comes in. Um, again, this is a really, really powerful tool for dealing with real-time data and, and summarizing and aggregating and transforming it. Uh, Cloudflare has a paper out there how they used it to, to really uh, make their system of, of monitoring much more efficient. Um, they're using Kafka for theirs. I think they may have even contributed one of the table engines for Kafka to, to ClickHouse project. Um, again, it's a simple create table um, command that you build the, the stream integration into Kafka. Uh, you define the topic and the login information and, and what the, the data source is. And, it, you know, it can be, you know, it can be text data, it can be binary data. Um, so it's very, very flexible looking at materials views materialized views um they can be used to summarize trans and transform data from one table to another on an ongoing basis uh it's not just the kafka and rabbit mq streams but you can also do it on normal tables so as you insert data in those tables the materialized views will run automatically and you can again transform aggregate that data and push it to other other tables for storage and later use um there's a specific uh, table called a merge, uh, summing merge tree table, and that's really good for storing aggregations. Since ClickHouse is highly par paralyzable, um, they have to do something special to store the, the aggregations um, without having to you know, lock the table and, and add everything up every time you do an insert. Um, so you combine that with the materialized view and then Kafka Rabbit MQ streaming and then Grafana to view it, I mean, it becomes a really, really powerful and easy way to do visualization of real-time data. As far as other interesting query features, um, there's, you can have JSON columns and, you know, you can you search those columns and extract, extract data from those columns. So it kind of gives you a semi-structured um, option as far as storing data in ClickHouse. There's a lot of really cool statistical functions in ClickHouse. There's like quantile functions, there's ranking, there's standard deviation, uh, distributions, um, a whole lot of other really uh, specialized um, functions that if you really want to look at your your statistics in, a, in, a, in more than just your ASR or ACD, there's a lot of cool things you can do with that. Um, they just added window functions um without getting too detailed description of that but it lets you do some special aggregations that you just can't do normally with sql um that are really really powerful um there's arrays there's tuples and maps and, and there's some clever things you can do with like arrays as far as being able to let's say you want to uh, associate um, different records with different times uh, you can store an array of times and let's say like say associated customer and then let's say you can then take the see what cdrs uh on the time stamp cdrs and see you know where in that array uh, and associate customer those fell in if, if you dealing with data that changes uh poor description but it's you can avoid doing some things you would normally need a store procedure or or basically you know python or some other scripting language to do 
Um, there's also cat boost integration. I've started sort of playing around with this and you know what cat boost is, it's Yandex's uh, gradient boosting machine learning toolkit. Um, it's built directly in the ClickHouse, so you can do your, your training and then inference direct, directly out of your ClickHouse data. Um, it's, it's a really interesting tool I've just started to play with to see, you know, as far as categorizing, categorizing call flow data. Um, another really useful feature in, in ClickHouse is full outer joins. Um, it basically joins two record sets and shows where data exists, not only in both data sets, um, but also if it exists in one data set or not another. I mean, traditional inner join only shows you where data exists in both record sets. Um, you know, left to right outer join will only give it to you, you know, on one on the left or the right side. So if you're trying to compare, let's say, two time frames, you know, this week versus last week, you know, for the first three days, um, it lets you see not only, you know, what data, you know, what calls were shared between both time frames, uh, but you can see, let's say, if traffic disappeared in, in this week and was there last week or last week where it wasn't there and you gained it this week. Um, MySQL doesn't have this feature. Postgres has it, but, you know, as far as like comparing uh, summaries over over two time spans, it's really, really, really um, ex um, excellent feature as far as being able to do that. As far as as of joins, uh, again, this is a really kind of really specialized, but really, really powerful feature. Uh, you can match on two record sets, you can do a join, uh, but the keys don't necessarily have to be exact matches. Um, it'll join on the closest match. So best example I have of this, um, you know, if you're trying to reconcile your CDRs versus a customer vendor, you'll know that your timestamps will never match up exactly with the customer vendor. And if you've got the same calling, calling numbers come in a couple times per minute, possibly, uh, you don't have call IDs, it becomes nearly impossible to line things up in a, in a good manner. Uh, and using the inexact match, you can use ClickHouse to kind of do a lot of that lineup work for you. Um, I, I had a customer with a dispute with a vendor. Uh, the vendor was showing duration, the customer was not. The problem with this was uh, the customer was sending a hundred million calls a day to the vendor. Uh, there, you know, there would be no way to do 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 this in Excel. You wouldn't be able to line up at this this kind of thing in Excel. Uh, but with ClickHouse, it made it really really easy to to line things up and narrow down where the discrepancies were, so you could you know look on a case by case basis and start to. Um, pick out you know, what was going on, what calls are you seeing, uh, the divergent behavior in the billing. Um, it turned out to be the vendor, uh, but it was one of those deals where, you know, their vendor was big, so had to, didn't have a leg to stand on. Um, as far as bloke, bloke loading data, getting data into ClickHouse the old-fashioned way, um, the ClickHouse CLI utility, lets you bulk load data very, very simply. Uh, it supports um, text formats, your normal CSV, your tab space, and, and JSON. There's binary formats, uh, your Captain Protocol, your Proto Protobuf, Avro, Parquet, Arrow, or Orc, um, from uh, other you know, uh, big data systems. As far as long-term maintenance, uh, the easiest way to get rid of data is, of course, to drop partitions. Uh, you can also detach those partitions and move them into different locations for archival. Uh, there's also a feature in ClickHouse you can define on a table, a TTL. Um, and so ClickHouse will automatically, every, I think, about 24 hours, go and look to see if there's expired data and automatically clean that data out and, and reprocess the, part, uh, the table parts and restore your disk space to you. Uh, ClickHouse... I think as of last year, or maybe the year before, supports updates and deletes. Uh, it's a little non-standard because uh, it's done with an alter table, but it's you can pretty much do almost everything you could in normal SQL, although joins are a little bit awkward. Um, you can do hot column adds and removals to tables. Um, so if you need to change your layout or change your uh, the column definition, you can do this. It's not it's not a blocking operation, so all new data will come in with the changes and it'll go back and rebuild the part, old part, parts of the data over time that need to change. 
Um, both this and updates or deletes, they're kind of expensive operations. Uh, I mean, if, if you're doing billions of rows on a SATA SSD, it's going to take a few hours. But if you're dealing with millions of rows, it's actually quite quick, you know, maybe seconds or even minutes to, to do these, um, what they call mutations, the updates, the deletes, and the, and the, and the table definition changes. As far as the future goes with ClickHouse, it's still under heavy development. They're still adding new features. Um, it's been really stable as far as um, not crashing, never had any data, data loss. Um, I, last year or so, if I, if I update my ClickHouse, it's because I want a new feature, uh, not because I need to fix a bug. Um, there's, it's still, um, you know, still new features being added on a regular basis. You know, every time I think, well, boy, wouldn't it be great if ClickHouse had this? Well, sure enough, I look, it's already there. Um, really last year and a half, there's more and more integrations with other software packages, open source, commercial. Um, it's really kind of reached escape velocity. Um, so I think is, you know, you're just going to eventually see pretty much any, everything out there that deals with data is going to support ClickHouse just because people are going to demand it. Um, I expect ClickHouse to, you, you know, commoditize the column source data source, open source column source data, database market, probably even cannibalize a lot of the commercial market. Um, I, in the past, I, I used for five or six years, I've used the MariahDB column store. It works great. It has its own quirks, but the compression isn't nearly as good as ClickHouse performance. In some cases, the order of magnitude slower than ClickHouse. It's just not nearly as a mature product as 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 ClickHouse is. I mean, there's commercial other commercial column store databases out there, um, Vertica, uh, Greenplum. Uh, you know, now all the all the call. I mean, you know, big vendors doing row store databases, SQL Server, and Oracle support you know some sort of column store. But I mean, just the the performance and speed, and of course, implementation costs of ClickHouse. I mean, just really isn't isn't matched by anything out there from what I've seen. Um, you know, we'll know it's 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 hit hit the most success when Amazon forks their own version of it and starts selling it as one of their managed services. Um, for as far as support out there, you know, I have no affiliation with ClickHouse. I just use it. Um, but there's a company out there called Altinity. They have a lot of great uh, information out there how to use ClickHouse and benchmarks that kind of stuff. They provide commercial support. Um, the uh, there's, you know, I said I mentioned Cloudflare uses it. Uh, uh, Lorenzo at QuickSip said they're basically a ClickHouse shop now. So I mean, that tells you that it's, you know, it's a, a very usable uh, product, you know, to bet your life on, so to speak. At least, at least at the scale most of us are, are operating at as, as smaller companies. Um, I guess that's really all I have to say at this point. If you have any questions, uh, let me know and I can answer them. Well, I'd like to be the first one to congratulate you. I've seen a lot of ClickHouse presentations uh, because, again, that, that's one of my favorite topics. But this one is really, uh, you know, kicking it out of the, the, the stadium. It's a fantastic material. Really, really a lot of uh, detail, even for a, an expert. I mean, I, I'm a big fan and even, you know, a, a couple of things you touched there, I consider them being, you know, niche, I think, for general users. So really well done. Just one thing I would like to add, but for the benefit of everyone, because we all care about, you know, at the end resources, ClickHouse has saved us and our customers a lot of money. So all of these advantages you mentioned are not just of a technical nature, but they translate into actual savings. And, you know, we all make something out of that. So well done. It's not a question really, but more of a compliment. No, no. What I, what I found is, I mean, like I said, I was running a lot of MariahDB column store or what it used to be InfinityB. And basically some of my customers were outgrowing their old E5 systems. I mean, ClickHouse is so much more efficient. They basically can reuse their old 10 year hardware and just keep, you know, milking it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we, you, know, you also saved me a whole bunch of slides from my presentation. I can cut off and just refer to yours now. <laughs> Go right ahead. Anything else? Uh, I have a question. Does it integrate with OpenSIPs? Um, <clears throat> No, not, 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 not directly. I mean, obviously, you know, you can, you can stream from RabbitMQ. Um, you know, you can do, you know, if you're storing CDRs in MySQL, there's multiple ways you can pull it into, into 
click house, you know, you can do a bulk imports. Um, when I'm using with open sips, I'm basically doing, doing bulk importing the CDRs from, from CD, CSV. Okay. Uh, can I, uh, take my turn now? <laughs> sure. sure. Otherwise I will take it from you. Uh, th thank you for the presentation, Jonathan. It was a, a lot of uh, really nice information in there. Um, I actually Let's have take a moment uh, here quick, quick, yeah, quick, right, quick, right, quick, quick, quick. Jonathan, thank you. Um, uh, I actually have quite a few comments just to uh, clear them out. Uh, first, you said that uh, there is no ACID compliance, right? So uh, we have to take our, there is no transactions, basically. So we have to do one query at a time. Uh, rather, if we have a more complex application, right, where um, we have more data depending on one another, maybe we should not go for ClickHouse, correct? Yes. Yeah. Correct. Like you know, if you if you're like doing relational, yeah, 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 relational based data, yeah, it's, it's not really there. And there's and there's no there's no, I don't think there's any isolation. I think I read that they maybe trying to add some isolation, but basically, if you're inserting data, and you're querying at the same time, um, you may see you know part of that insert as you're querying, dependent on just you know what's happening at what time. Okay. Um... Uh, at some point, you talked about um, some some uh, caching that uh, is going on, just so you so the join query is optimized. Um, I'm not sure I if you could go back and oh oh the dictionaries with the dictionary optimization. Yeah, so uh, as I perceived it, it seems like a specific use case, and you couldn't uh, use it for any join you would have. Uh, did I? read it correctly well i mean you basically you predefine the dictionary and then you can use it in all your queries on click house um well, i yeah. mean like, like, i mean example where i'm where i've used it is basically you know my cdrs just my raw cdrs are are in are in click house i've got my customer data in in yeah. mysql and then i you know i can do i can do a lookup based on the, the ip you. address to the customer mm -hmm. Because the, that data doesn't change. Maybe you take the CDRs of the last day or something like that. Um, right. So yeah, it's not changing yeah. all the it, not all the time. And with the auto refresh, you don't have to maintain it. it. Cool. Cool. Um, uh, the, the ngram uh, Bloom filter version one that, that was amazing. Uh, really, that's uh, this is just a comment. It's just uh, a problem I had run into at some point, and I'm glad I found out about this one. Could be very useful for textual searching. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, really opens up uh, what you can do with a column database having this. Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, uh, I would, I will dare to correct you on one of the slides. You said that uh, MySQL does not have left or right outer join. Um, it, it, it doesn't have full outer joins. Oh, full outer joins. Gotcha. Oh, okay, okay. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, you, you, you yeah. have to, I think you do a union to get what you want generally. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to, if you're trying to Got get Got mismatch data. Okay. So that's all on me. Thank I you. May, I, you, you I may, I may have, I may have misspoke, but yeah, it's, it's, it's the full outer join that MySQL does not have. So so here's an interesting presentation. Uh, I was, I've been looking at it. I haven't ever used Yandex. Uh, this is the ClickHouse system. I see it does a lot of stuff for streaming in. Does it do anything for streaming out? Like materialized views streamed out to Postgres or anything like that? You know, I, I, I've never used it. I think so. Um, but I would have to double check I, um, whether you can do inserts into it. Um, I don't 100% recall whether you could or not. Um, you can do, certainly with like the external tables, you can do inserts into external tables. Okay. I've used materialize.io, uh, their system, to do read from a stream of data, compute a SQL function, and then spit it out to an external system. And so that's not like a super interesting thing for here. Yeah, I know for sure, like I said, I know you for sure you can do it with the external table engines. Um, but I, I don't know off the top of my head whether the, the Kafka and RabbitMQ support the inserts or not. But yeah, that would be really, yeah, really, really useful because then you could just use the materialized view to do the computation and put put it back into a topic or or queue. 
Do we have any other questions? Yes, yes. I'm holding still in here. I see you shaking. I am. <laughs> very excited, very excited. Thanks again for the presentation. Um, I have a question, a generic question, if you can give us a little bit information about scaling from the perspective of uh, uh, how much... Uh, machines, what will be the right, uh, from your experience, what will be the right structure uh, for something to can feel, let's say, uh, 100 million CDR a day? Uh, what will be like the general proposals that you would say to deploy uh, every, a lot of data uh, to click out? Um. On server. <laughs> well, to, to certain certain degree, I can only I can only really talk to what I use, and since I, since my customers uh, tend to be smaller, um, you know, that that I, I primarily used. I think the biggest system I've used has maybe like twenty cores uh, plus hyper threading. Um, with the compression, um, assuming assuming say you said 100 million CDRs a day, One uh, I, I'd use you know you can use SATA SSDs you know maybe I don't know how much data you want to how many months data you want to store, um, but like I have a fairly comprehensive CDR and it presses down to about 100 110 bytes per row. Um, wow. So, so. I know that helps you do some of the math, but yeah, I mean, doing, you know, two terabyte, uh, again, since there's not a lot of random IO, you, um, and you're not doing a lot of data changes, we've, we've primarily used, uh, you know, SATA, uh, SATA SSDs, non-enterprise, um, you know, so, you know, crucial MX 500s or Samsung's, that kind of thing, um, you know, get two terabytes drives. Um, and I would say, you know, with, with, See, I'm I'm storing about a, yeah, I'm storing about a billion rows. Um, I think in man, sorry, uh, lack of sleep. But um, all I can say, all I can really say is is you don't unless you're really really doing a whole lot of uh, joins and 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 pair, uh, multiple queries at once. I've been able to get by with. Uh, your your E5 Xeon version twos, ones, threes, um, and be able to to you know work on uh, active data sets of about uh, I would say about three to four hundred million rows at a time, um, and have uh, you know probably sub fifteen second response time as far as queries goes, as far as um, running queries to analyze statistics to to tag. Uh, bad traffic flows and 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 use that to to block or adjust the routing on them um, but but yeah it, it scales down very nicely um sata ssds and and like i said and and old hardware at least at least anything i've ever dealt with that's more than enough to solve all all my operational problems and that you know i think i think the biggest table i have um, has about 120 billion rows in it. Um, and that's for archival. It's running on a, on a, I think a 12 core, uh, Xeon X5670. Um, I can summarize, it's got 16 gigs of RAM. I can summarize, you know, a month's worth, which is about 300, uh, about five or 6 billion rows in a few minutes. And that's platter storage. Mm -hmm. And there is any way of uh, scaling it between uh, multiple servers from yes, 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 yes. I, I didn't, I didn't get into that, but there's, but there's replication, uh, and it'll, you can shard the data, and then you can run the queries um, in a parallel fashion across the cluster. How does it do multi data center like geo, geo distributed? It uses Zookeeper to. I think to keep track of things, I, I I haven't really played around with with the replication. I just tend to just do multiple ETL pipelines, 
Actually, uh, there's good news there, if I can jump in. Uh, they just yeah. released the latest version, uh, 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 ClickHouse Keeper, which replaces ZooKeeper, the worst part of you know the mix there. So now ClickHouse is able to uh, internally basically color that function, so it can cluster itself. And this ClickHouse Keeper replaces, you know, in general, that function. So it's, it's actually really easy and it clusters surprisingly well. Geo distributed again? Yeah. That's sexy. Nice. Back. The definition You're... of sexy is very real, but uh, I almost can't agree with you about it. I was just about to say, Max is looking a little sexier. He's like dressed down now. His usual, like, number two of three outfits for the day. I think you change outfits with every presentation. No, not really. <laughs> it's more like a random. I, I think I can explain that, Alex. It's a ploy to keep the authorities guessing. Ah, indeed. Well, listen, he's already got them thinking he's in the room in Amsterdam. I don't know what else he needs to do. <laughs> um, so, look, that's actually, let's give Jonathan one more round of applause, everyone. Thank you Thank so you. much for answering all these questions, Jonathan. So, uh, I hear there's a news flash. We have an update. I'm, uh, I hear Bogdan here. He's in my ear. What's that? Yes. Okay. Let him know, Bogdan. Um, yeah, we have some uh, good progress with, uh, with, the, uh, with the audit. Uh, people are, as uh, Alex says, are uh, digging in for the change uh, in, the, in their pockets. Uh, thank you, um, everyone. Uh, and I think we are getting really, really, really close and uh, almost dead to win the bet for uh, on uh, on Friday. So, uh, yeah. Nice. Nice. Money. Nice. Let's go, people. We're there. We're, how much further do we need to go, Bogdan? Do you know? You, oh, man, that number? you touched uh, the sensible point, which is doing math. <laughs> ah. uh, uh, I think roughly like uh, 1,000 and a bit. Like 1,300 or so. That's it. Wow. We already crossed 50% of the divide that we are started with this morning. We have one more presentation, people. Let's do this. There's plenty <laughs> of time for you to surf over to GoFundMe or use your PayPal and donate to the Open Sips project. We've got 13 and a bit to go. So for our next presentation, I know that you've all been anxiously waiting to, to hear from him because subspace has been our sponsor for the summit this year and we're really looking forward to william king who's uh, going to be talking to us about global rtc in a post-covid world and let us know a little bit more about what subspace is doing william are you there i am let me set up um screen while william's getting set up i want to let everyone know that no kittens were harmed in the production of this summit <laughs> All right, let's see. Cool. How's the view? Looking good. Looking awesome. good. So I'll say um, I've got multiple, uh, a few different green slides in the middle. Feel free for anybody who's here to jump in and ask some questions. I'm going to go a little bit quickly. I've got a little bit more data uh, to share than we've got minutes in the hour. Uh, but one thing, this is going to be, I'm having an announcement at the end. Also, this is the first public technical look at the technology behind the scenes for subspace. So let's cover a bunch. Um, I'll go through kind of like who is subspace, then jump into basically global RTC in the post-COVID, and then how does subspace do it, and then how can you use it? So jumping right in. Hey, folks. William King, Quintus Rex. Uh, having fun. It's actually really, really fun to be back uh, to open SIPs. Uh, I look forward to being able to be in person again soon. Who is Subspace? We're building a premier private network globally for secure real-time. Most of the internet wasn't built for real-time systems. Subspace is building a version of it that actually is, and every millisecond counts. Our mission is actually to make remote work. Ton of different use cases that are out there where people have tried to build stuff on the internet, have tried to be able to have folks working from home, and actually, this community is probably one of the most interesting ones who have been trying to solve all those problems. Um, Subspace is here to make it easier. If it works in your garage, we should be able to help you make it work on a global basis. Uh, we did lag-free gaming. 
uh, low latency inline DOS, be able to have more players playing the same location. Most players don't like the idea of only playing in the same one city. They want to play with their friends who don't live in the same place. So we go for that. We're doing it by being able to say you can get intense command and control of the network, to be able to control what the network actually looks like more so than anybody ever thought possible and be able to do in-network ap applications. Past, present, and future. So Akamai in the mid nineties democratized the internet in terms of storage. You could store files, you can put them all over the, uh, the planet, but Akamai was one of the first ones to really make it so you can have an API store one file anywhere. Amazon came through and did that later uh, for compute. You could put with a quick API, you can put compute anywhere. Problem is nobody's ever done it really for network or at least not for low latency, real time networking. And that's where subspace comes in. We're democratizing that third leg of what the internet is. And we're going for the goal of be within five milliseconds of 95% of the internet connected population. And so that's going to be well over a thousand points of presence, but we've built the company to be able to do that and do it quick. We started off in multiplayer gaming. Turns out everybody uh, likes to game. There's a huge amount of gaming and public internet was completely failing for video games because the internet wasn't built for real time. Any kind of competitive interactive game, uh, you're always running into whenever the cloud uh, providers changed their networking a little bit or whenever an ISP made a change, gamers felt it and called in often to their ISPs. And so we've been able to go through and provide both latency, jitter and packet loss um, resolution. So gamers are able to enjoy and work around the internet weather that's happening all the time. And denial of service, it's a thing. There are different years where it's way more popular, but gaming is always getting hit by DOS. In fact, there are actual sites where for a dollar, you can have a DOS attack launched against your game server so that your loss doesn't count against you. Well, Subspace makes it basically a non-issue. And we do that in line, so it's fun. And work from anywhere. Everyone with COVID suddenly went uh, home where it used to be part-time or most people didn't work from home. Now basically everybody is. And so how do you maintain QoS with a remote workforce? That's a crazy thing. SD-WAN, MPLS, a lot of different solutions were done to be able to put people in offices and be able to have IT be able to control and fix that network. Well, now when you've got gone from like five or 10 offices to 10,000 offices because everyone's at home, those solutions just don't make sense. Well, now we do. And Subspace is being able to bring quality from all of the agents at home all the way through to your PBX, wherever their agents or PBX are in the world. Again, it's a global system. Quick questions to start off, or we jump right into the next. Jump. Yeah, I mean, just a comment on the five milliseconds. It, it, it's mm -hmm. amazing, especially since a lot of uh, online gaming competitions, uh, rather online games host their competitions in a LAN environment just because it is not possible for, you know, America and, uh, you know, uh, Middle Europe yeah. or Eastern Europe to communicate. So, yeah, sounds good. Yeah. I see that every single day. <laughs> I've got friends in EU that I can play from Seattle and actually have a, a decent experience now. So, so what does it look like remote work right now? So pre-COVID, 47% of employees had said that they had never worked from home at all. But the key piece over here is how many people went full time. So pre-COVID, it was only 17% of respondents to this particular survey said they had worked five days or more a week from home to 44%. So basically global in the span of about one to three months, we saw basically a 10 year adoption curve shift. So everything that, that this community and others have been going through to try and improve things, what WebRTC is promising to be able to support better at home to uh, a call center or at home to a service, what Google Meet is able to try and provide, we saw that adoption curve shift so far and so rapidly, a lot of companies just weren't ready for it. And a lot of systems had very difficult times uh, responding to it. And actually, depending on which side of the uh, equation uh, you stand on, so there's a couple of folks who are saying, look, we got up to 53% of permanently working from home. 
and we may come down to about 40%. But what Subspace is saying, look, it doesn't matter. The network globally shouldn't matter where you're going to be at home or in the office or you're at somebody else's home. You're traveling on a conference. We should be able to actually trust that the internet works for real time. Everyone here has probably seen something like this, where if you're trying to trust something going over the public internet, the variability is immense. And the internet response time for being able to download certain files is incredible when you compare it to a private network. And these, this is just one small example of trying to go from different cities globally to another city. The internet, again, was just not built to be able to put any kind of high quality latency sensitive type of traffic over the public internet, the best effort. Subspace is basically saying, with now with the quick service, you can get that private network capability, uh, simple and easy. So a lot of people are thinking about the network realities. What are you trying to do with the network? What, what do you need out of your network? Not all networks were created equally, and a global network is really necessary. It's an incredible hassle if you've got to be able to have one solution for Europe one solution for North America, several solutions for South America. Can't find a solution for the Middle East. Well, a global network is able to give that kind of one solve, solves for everything. I think folks here kind of recognize this type of an interface. Lorenzo, appreciate it. Um, a lot of times when you're running a remote call center, you've got the problem of an agent or somebody will call you up and say, hey, yesterday at about this time, we had a major issue with a call. Well, you can't fix what you can't measure. And the speed at which you're able to measure it matters immensely. So doing this same day or after is awesome. And using things like Homer and Hepic to be able to get that visibility is incredible. But the time to be able to measure it and the time to be able to fix it matters a ton. What if you could actually fix it in real time? And like going into a single call, Call was totally fine for a while, except from very specific spots when things went crazy. And there are great systems now, better than there were uh, five years ago, to be able to do this at a large scale. The previous presenter was showing ClickHouse. There are database systems now that can give you this kind of um, incredible insight and run these computations in real time so you can see it. But a lot of systems can't actually do anything about it. Well, this is probably what your network usually looks like. You've got your media servers. You've got your SIP proxies in one location. You've probably got your call center agents in another location. Subspace makes it super simple to be able to route that type of traffic over the subspace proxies. And so now you can basically reduce the need for an MPLS or an SD-WAN type of deployment and be able to run an actual single global uh, LAN-like network uh, over for whatever your use case, whether it be call center agents or uh, in office or at home. A key piece that I want to call out here is when we were designing this system, we're actually using uh, so a product called a SIP uh, teleport. It's a stateful proxy. So just routing the registrations and the calls to this proxy is able to swap out and route the media. We don't look at the, the actual payloads of the media, but we're, and it requires no other hardware or installation. But it's a simple uh, proxy that's able to, like RTP proxy or RTP engine, just proxy the media through another path. And you get to actually take advantage of a huge uh, network performance system. A key piece that I want to call out here is we're actually doing the weather mapping for all of the global network and measuring in real time much faster than the RTCP reports are coming in, looking for the quality, looking for where routers and other congestion is happening. And we're actually able to reroute those streams because we have an anycast network on the outside. We're able to reroute the streams without breaking the calls and without losing packets. And in doing so, be able to do inline DOS protections. Really sucks when you've got a PBX or some other game system that gets hit by a DOS attack. because There's not usually anything you can do. So for the folks here in the audience, now it's time for some tech. We did a little bit of business. We did a little bit of the other side of it. How does Subspace actually make this work um, in a real-time way? So at a high level, Subspace has four products. So Packet Accelerator, which is an IP proxy. SIP Teleport, it's a SIP proxy. Global Turn, it's just a turn server. And it looks like a single turn server that's five milliseconds away from everybody. 
an RTP speed, which is not uh, released yet, which is basically going to be like an open source drop-in. If you're using RTP proxy or RTP engine type use case, you'll be able to jump in and just route your media over it without having to use a SIP proxy in the middle. On So that's the level that we bring everything up to. But underneath is where we've got our time systems and telemetry, physical servers and optical transceivers being optimized, our anycast routing and our dynamic pathfinding globally, all this real-time inline compute, both for D, uh, DDoS mitigation, but also uh, advanced telemetry and other like inline applications. There's a lot of use cases where uh, you can't actually send in a, in a reasonable latency a media path, let's say to Frankfurt. If you're gonna put every single uh, audio call through a data center in Frankfurt, as one example, to do audio transcoding. That's fine for people in, in Western or Northern Europe, but for the rest of the globe, it doesn't really work. We've actually built out a system that enables us to be able to deploy inline compute for those type of use cases, so that wherever your two parties on a call are, the compute is determined to be in between. And in order to do a lot of this, we actually have some pretty serious ISP partnerships and uh, BTP optimizations. Again, reiterating, our, our, we are deploying hundreds of pops in the next year on the way to sub five milliseconds from the global population. Cool. Quick, simple way of how things work. To access the SIP Teleport API, you give us a, a SIP URI, we give you back a SIP URI. You provision that SIP URI out to all of the agents. Your agents are able to register through it and they get to your normal PBX and then calls in or out to the agents go through our proxy. So that proxy basically makes it so that we're we're locating geographically both sides of those connections, determining what's the lowest latency paths between them and the highest quality. There are a lot of use cases where latency matters more than packet loss, and there are others where packet loss matters more than latency. So where's that trade-off? Well, the subspace network is actually able to make multiple versions of those computations. And then we're actually able to do that because we're deploying so many edge pops. We've got multiple different options for what's the physical connectivity to use to be able to send that from one set of edge pops through to other set of edge pops to wherever your um, computing is, whether it's in your own data center, what's in one of the cloud computing services, and then wherever your, uh, to whatever your PBX server is. Again, we're able to do this with these uh, pieces in mind. Okay, let's see. I said we're deploying a lot of places. This is the current status. And some of these, we've actually got multiple deployments in the same city. But when we started this call, or when we started uh, working on the slides for this, Subspace was the 16th most IX interconnected network in the world. And as of last night, we're now the 14th. And so we're moving really quick, really quick on this. Yeah. 14th in, a two, uh, in about a two-week span. One of the things to think about uh, is we would have been the 13th, but Fastly announced that they added one more. And so they got one more step. We'll catch up to them soon. So think about the subspace network. We're about 20% infrastructure. There's a bunch of attempts that have tried to solve this type of a global real-time network before. But the problem is a lot of the infrastructure is, isn't proper. There's not enough spare infrastructure that's around everywhere that's accessible to be able to actually provide this. The subject is actually deploying hardware, low latency optical paths, bringing in all kinds of different fiber uh, to make it accessible so that the real time systems are able to communicate point to point easily. So there we are, uh, according to Hurricane Electric. And you can always go into Peering DB to see more information on if we're in a certain uh, geography or not. Um, but I'll say, you might wanna check this often. Quick example, when I'm saying that we're putting physical hardware in places, this is an example of a small uh, point of presence. And these fiber optic lines, you can imagine the speed on it. Now going back to what I pointed out previously, you can't fix what you can't measure. And a major part of what Subspace is being able to uh, provide is how do we fix routing from any two points on the planet? And a huge amount of that is based on being able to do what Waze or Google Maps have done for uh, routing and turn-by-turn and -turn directions. We're actually going through and collecting telemetry, synthetic uh, and non, over all these different possible links 
and being able to put an optimized path from any one point in the planet to any of the other points. And this is a huge amount of software to do it. And a lot of the software that we found just wasn't functional. Like it didn't function to this level. Um, so we're weather mapping in real time. We're also weather mapping unidirectional paths. And what that means is I can tell the latency from Frankfurt to LA separate from LA to Frankfurt. And so we're not just doing the RTT divided by two. And so we're able to do this because we've got GPS locked time synchronization across many of these pops. And then from the other pops, we're able to go off of our own time services. And every 10 milliseconds, we're able to send uh, test packets or synthetic packets to be able to measure for jitter, latency, loss in unidirectionals, able to combine that in real time to be able to do uh, the global graph. And so <laughs> um, we're measuring and being able to do this over time. So there's a temporal graph that we're actually looking at and sub-second latency for what's the quality. So we know when a particular path is getting congested. We know how, how congested is it? What's the second, third, and fourth best uh, alternative path? Is it time to move the traffic or a subset of the traffic to the second or third path? And we can know, because we've got the graph processing on it, we can know which subsets of traffic make the most sense to move and when. It took a custom global router to be able to do this. Most of the systems that are out there today don't handle the number of routes that we look at. When you're looking at every single major city and every single ISP combination to every single other major city and ISP, that's way larger than you'd normally get from an ISP level router. And if you're planning on deploying uh, over a thousand pops globally, you can't really budget in those ISP level routers. So we had to figure out a new way to do this. Also, the existing routing systems, one, didn't react fast enough. We want to be able to change routes so that when you're on a live call, when there's a fiber cut or when there's a major issue, the participants don't get their call dropped. That the network is able to adapt fast enough that the participants might see a small hiccup or might not notice it at all. Also, most of the internet's designed for hot potato routing, which basically means every, every system is trying to take it as short as possible to hand it to the next ISP. And so subspace takes a cold potato routing. We'll pick it up as quickly as we can, take it as far as we can, and then hand it off to the next, uh, to the actual endpoints. And as uh, some folks in this community will kind of know, trying to do any cast synchronization for stateful systems in real time, that's an incredibly hard problem, both mathematics and engineering. Uh, and we were recently granted the patents for that. So I can now talk about some of that publicly. That inline compute system, we're able to do things within the actual call path. We don't need to figure out which server is going to be able to be the fastest one to run it through because we already know multiple different options between any two points. And so we're able to do things like denial of service protection. Denial of service protection at the ingress point. So where the bots and everything else are generating the traffic, we're able to scrub it there, usually inside the ISP that's being generated rather than trying to do so at the server side. And so if you've got a server being attacked, it's incredibly easy for a small subset of the internet traffic volume to be able to overwhelm an ISP or a neighborhood router. So that's why we scrub it where it starts, which also lets us know where that traffic is generating from. It also makes it super easy uh, to be able to scrub spoofed traffic. If you've got systems within one ISP and there's traffic coming from randomized spoofed IP addresses, it's real easy to be able to say, there's no way in the world the internet would route an ISP from a different continent through this residential ISP uh, to our network. We're already uh, deploying a lot of major internet providers and growing rapidly. Anybody who will see this, if you're working with an ISP, reach out and talk to us. Uh, we deploy quick and we really help on the real-time systems, both from gamers and call centers and expanding. A major factor when you're dealing with a low latency network is edge and BGP optimization. It is a nightmare when dealing with an Anycast network. You can start with one data center and announce over a, a few different uh, links. And that's good for getting resiliency. But if you're trying to be able to go and say that every millisecond counts, 
this type of a project is an ongoing major task. And so we're looking at how do we, how do we optimize for every sets of users and every city and ISP pair to our nearest set of pops so that those users can get to any other city and location. As an example, if you've got a gamer from Italy trying to play with their friends in LA or in Tokyo or somewhere else, this is the level of optimization that's needed in order to be able to make it so that people can think about the planet as actually being a smaller system. Subspace on this is actually targeting 100 kilometers per millisecond of round trip time. And so the distance between two participants, divide it or take the kilometers, divide by 100. That's roughly the RTT that you should see over this type of a, a PGP optimized network. And it really does take being uh, present at all of the major IXs and the second and third tier smaller ones, which is why I'm calling out that we're already the 14th largest network in terms of IX participation. Here's an example of what this actually looks like. So players in Saudi Arabia playing in, in Bahrain on a game server, their latencies were well above 170, 180 uh, because the internet was taking the scenic path. It was taking the, the long way to the game server, either on the way there or on the way back or both. And post subspace, basically, these are cities. So the major population areas are now grouping up because that's the actual distance for the players, rather than being a, uh, a smoother curve. And it's so it's the equivalent of giving BGP GPS capabilities. Turkey to Frankfurt is another example. We're able to take a lot of gamers and traffic that median in the low 70s, and be able to take it to sub 40 for many and sub 50. And for a lot of calls and games, this is a major, major difference. Because when you're looking at it and saying, for a real-time system, the better it performs, the more people want to use it, the more people can engage with it, and there's a networking compounding effect. And so you can actually get way better engagement results by actually fixing the quality of the network because you don't have drop calls. You don't have random audio quality problems. And when Subspace is talking about being able to uh, significantly improve it, for folks here who have been trying to triage Wireshark captures and the like, what if you could actually know for sure that the problem is within five milliseconds of the end user's device? So if somebody's on their laptop making a call, what if you know for sure the problem is no more than five milliseconds away from that laptop. It's either in that laptop, in that Wi-Fi, or right at that neighborhood level. And that's the thing that we can do. Quick questions? There are some on the channel. Cool. All right, I'll add the channel ones uh, at the end, unless somebody wants to call one out. Might take a moment to, to read through a little bit of the scroll. No, at the very bottom, there is a question, specific question from Dennis. Yeah, so that's a good way to ask it. So um, actually, I can answer that with our different, uh, with the next set of slides. So yes, subspace is basically saying you can use subspace as a proxy to be able to get from a user to a server and back. And that proxy service is able to use a standards-based interface to be able to do that. So these standard interfaces, we support basically any kind of traffic. If it's UDP or TCP, you can go through and use our packet accelerator. And you give us an IP and a port and a protocol, we'll give you an IP, a port, and a protocol. You give the subspace proxy one to all the end users, and they can connect to it. Same thing for SIP teleport. You want a SIP call? Here's a quick SIP proxy. You just route things through. TLS enabled as well. Uh, we have a global turn that I can actually announce. Uh, there's a couple of folks in the audience here that I see are on the live stream. They're at the front of the line. The private beta for global turn is starting this week. And so basically, here's a single turn server. So rather than having previously where you had 10 global term servers or 10 servers deployed globally, you now have one that looks like it's five milliseconds away from everybody. And RTP speed is still in the works. So got a little bit more cooking to do on that one. But basically it's gonna be able to connect with any kind of an open source uh, SIP signaling system 
uh, and basically has the equivalent of an RTB proxy and RTB engine drop in. So anybody who's already got uh, open source systems for either call routing or the like, and with a single config change, go and uh, proxy some of these for better call quality. Packet accelerator, global acceleration, simple setup, inline security. So you're getting quality and performance. A big part here is it's about the determinism. We've been able to take a chaotic, very variable uh, weathered uh, internet system and make it into something that's deterministic and predictable. SIP teleport, voice and video, route calls through it. It's a simple SIP URI to SIP URI. And it just makes remote work. And it's designed to be functional with all of the more modern security systems. So TLS signaling, SRTP, et cetera. Global turn, simple provision a short-lived credential. Give it to a, a turn client, either SIP or WebRTC. Let that client negotiate a turn system. And now you've got the effectively point-to-point -point turn on a global basis, either from end users or to servers. Again, inheriting all of the same simple setup, which is config, and inline security. And RTP speed. Same thing, just making it simple. Trying to make it super simple for somebody to be able to use a network like ours. So anybody wanting to test this out, jump on the wait list. We've got a couple of folks who are actually here from Subspace in the chat, but you can really just go visit this URL and type in this code. Uh, you'll get con contacted and be able to jump on our wait list. Subspace isn't overselling network capacity. And so we've got to be able to slowly onboard customers and regions uh, so that we don't overwhelm everything. But we're building out incredibly fast. And we're able to build capacity at a rate that no other network has really seen possible. Thanks, folks. Thank you, William. That was amazing. <laughs> so this is what I've been doing for the last five years when I've had my heads down quiet. <laughs> building something big in the background. Definitely big, huge. Well, I, I think that uh, we're kind of uh, shocked there, and <laughs> we want to co Alex, congratulate you're, you're with you. You're you nice. that Alex was giving you perhaps the, the biggest accolade, the silent yeah. applause there. <laughs> <laughs> So one of the fun things, um, the thing that I'm probably most proud of is the team that we've assembled at Subspace is probably some of the best engineers in the world and still growing. We were able to launch originally a production network in the Middle East. We had a big customer come to us and say, hey, can you build a production network in the Middle East in the summer in 105 calendar days? And we're like, well, that's impossible for at least a half dozen reasons. But we did it anyway. And so... <laughs> That DNA in the company has been able to do some incredible fun stuff. Yeah, I think in the, in, uh, in the Middle East, there is also the problem when it comes to the networks. Uh, um, because uh, naturally, most of, the, uh, most, of, most of the internet provider, they do block at least uh, voice over IP traffic. So uh, uh, basically, with the subspace, I think you, you tackle multiple uh, issues at the same time. So you act like a kind of, let's say, a VPN from this perspective, also addressing the performance of the network. So it's uh, uh, one, uh, one solution uh, solves, let's say, all. I hope I don't go so far <laughs> with this. So we haven't released it yet, but one of the things about the custom global routers, being able to go through and say, hey, I want to be able to run calls or do this other type of traffic, except I don't want my traffic going through particular countries for whatever reason. And so the algorithm is able to go through and say, great, here's the best routes you've got, excluding those countries that you don't want to go through for whatever compliance reasons. It, it sounds like you've become like the big data owner of you know, <laughs> all network topologies everywhere. I, we're not dealing with small data sets, but I'm really dealing with real-time systems. And so for a lot of the stuff that folks are dealing with here, we're probably producing well over a handful of terabytes worth of telemetry and trying to process that in, in sub-second um, and run that through our other systems. So 
Milliseconds right. really do matter. <laughs> right, yeah. So it's not necessarily the size of the data, but it's the age of the data yep. that's critical. Yep. When you've got a, right. uh, a bucket, uh, every tsunami looks big. <laughs> do we have any questions? Well, I think the I think the guys from uh, Subspace did a very good uh, job in uh, answering uh, in real time in every millisecond deep count uh, on the uh, on the channel answering. There is there is some question about five G support. So it's um, oh, that's a great. Really one. So one of the fun things that Subspace gets to do is because we can deploy so small, we can deploy inside of mobile networks, and that inside mobile networks means we're able to pick it up. So that for 5G support, you've got one, the radio access side, that's able to reduce that radio access latency, but you've also ended up with a much more granular. There are more towers, more interconnects around. And so we're able to pick up that traffic more geographically close to the actual user. And because it's an anycast network, as users are moving, we're able to keep that same session connected and open. So you don't get session drops because somebody moved from one tower to another tower. 5G is a great thing, but it also makes the internet route tables a nightmare because everything goes from really, really big IP blocks to really, really small neighborhoods for routing. Giovanni. Oh. <laughs> really? Even Giovanni? <laughs> I'm kind of overwhelmed because <laughs> it's, yeah. uh, it's uh, I mean, what we uh, always uh, were expecting and uh, were waiting for. And uh, I mean, it's kind of a, a dream uh, that uh, comes true. And uh, uh, wow, I'm looking for, uh, I mean, uh, I use it and uh, work on it. Uh, and propose to my customers, uh, etc. And um, for uh, for what is uh, your experience? Uh, I, I, I try to have a question. Um, what can be uh, the interest of uh, uh, working with uh, subspace uh, uh, from a career point of uh, view? So uh, let's say. Uh, that national carrier uh, is offering uh, uh, cloud PBX uh, to small medium enterprises. Uh, it has something uh, uh, to gain from you because uh, its own, uh, uh, let's say, uh, kind of uh, customers are national and more or less uh, they do national calls. And uh, that's the question. Yeah. Um, so a really easy part of it. So a lot of the cloud systems have put out products like Amazon's got Global Accelerator, Google's got premium networking. There are a lot of attempts to be able to say, hey, here's how you do a better, uh, more performant network and more stable networking. But as we've seen from games and other real times, anybody who's tried to run a large scale media system in one of the cloud providers, it's not as easy as it sounds. And it's actually got a lot of gotchas, especially in terms of performance. Subspace is peering in with all of these clouds and be able to take that tra uh, traffic from wherever the end users are uh, for that carrier or between carriers. And so if you've got a carrier in one geographic region in one cloud, connecting with SBCs in another geographic region or in their own private data center, subspace can sit between the two being, and for most machine to machine things, being less than two milliseconds from either side and being able to control how we get it in and out. And so we're actually able to pick between multiple different ingresses into the cloud. So if an AZ has a problem or a network interconnect failure, we're able to switch it over to a different one and the like. So there's a lot of benefit for just predictability. So that cost per minute for a lot of carriers and other media systems is dropping pretty quickly. But that also means that the quality problems are also uh, increasing. And so Subspace is able to say, we can't solve inside of the cloud, but we can at least remove that public internet component of that calculus. We also make it so that you can easily choose which cloud you want to be in. Subspace has a simple IP block. And so for a lot of carriers, if you're trying to move from one data center, move from one cloud to another, you can basically use the subspace media IP blocks as that firewall allow list, and then move wherever you've got your media servers and things behind it um, to wherever the compute makes more sense for you. Because the customers and the endpoints are only seeing that subspace proxy of media IP set. 
Uh, William, I have a, a kind oh. of a, a perhaps a more commercial question, and that is, are you guaranteeing these things? Because as we know, ISPs are notorious for telling you, no, we'll give you uh, up to this speed. But in real life, it turns out, and uh, when you're saying every millisecond counts, you know, how, how can you guarantee that to your customers? So far, we haven't um, needed to go through and actually provide those SLAs and, and, and guarantees. It's not off the table, and we'd love to negotiate for something like that. But what I go through and say is, look, um, we've had customers come through, and within a half hour of being granted an API access, they've got calls going through it. And in some cases, the IT manager is going through and saying, okay, the issue with this particular customer is solved. 45 minutes after they jump on a call, it's now gone. The push for that SLA is usually, okay, we'll deal with that later. Right. The proof is in the pudding. Good stuff. Yeah, I have, I have a question actually more on the cost side. Um, so <clears throat> do you have any estimate of how much it's going to cost extra for somebody to push traffic through subspace? Um, compared to going to public internet? Yeah, so we actually published our pricing. It's consumption based. We've got a version of it for call centers that's a per minute fee or per concurrent agent fee. But in looking at that consumption based pricing, um, we had somebody on an internal hackathon do a quick test and they were like, all right, for somebody who's watching a lot of 4K movies on Netflix, how does it compare to Netflix? And it was roughly about the same as the monthly subscription fee for Netflix. So when you kind of do that math, it, it comes out pretty well. Um, and uh, Balin is actually in the channel. So anybody who wants to get more specific on that pricing, he can work some magic. All right, sounds. So. I believe you, you, you have yeah, some. I, have a, uh, <laughs> I saw him jumping up and down. Yeah, I have one of the bit of clarifications on um, the the entry barrier to to collaborating with subspace because earlier on you described that you can work at basically the highest of levels uh, right interconnecting um, cloud providers so they route uh, between clouds uh, in a much more performant way and not a cross public internet but at the same time you can also collaborate with uh, gaming companies who just want their players to connect to a really performant. Um, network. So my question was, what is the minimal entry barrier? Like what kind of a game company would I have to be in order to be able to route traffic to, to your network? Like, do I have to have maybe, you know, 10,000 users on my app or, you know, yeah. Um, I'll say, uh, I'll let the, the sales guys usually, it's, it's much lower than you'd expect. Our sales guys are going to do it. Uh, but what, one thing that I look at is if somebody's willing to go through and run through an interrupt and go through and test it, and do a quick write-up of like, all right, what did it take? Did it just work? What are some of the configuration pieces? That'll get my attention. Got so if you, if you have folks who have an interesting use case, even though it might be small, but you want to do a write-up of, hey, this is how quick it is to set it up with open SIPs. Here's how quick it is to set like uh, a WebSocket connection or a WebRTC over subspace. That goes a long way. Got it. OK, thank you for the answer. Yeah. Uh, and there was a question in the channel, how does the subspace network handle large spikes in traffic? Uh, any degradations in performance of the network? Most large spikes are either from de denial of service attacks or major events. We've been able to handle some of the largest game events that happened globally over the last two years with no issue. In fact, we survived when several other well-known name uh, companies had, network goes, had networks go down. And that's because our custom global system is actually measuring and monitoring and able to look at all of the possible paths. And so we don't just rely on a single point of failure. We've got that resiliency through all the different combinations. Also, when we're doing denial of service, we're scrubbing it where it starts. And so it's real hard to be able to get past that. Not impossible. It's just real yeah. difficult. Yeah. <laughs> fun, fun. Do we have, I have any a, questions? I have one. Um, <laughs> did you do you also have DCs in Europe uh, at this time, or just US? Oh, okay. Yeah. So you weren't watching the view. There was a map. That's a, yeah, <laughs> maybe I missed it. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I can actually pull it up real quick. It's a thing about having too many slides. Yeah, there was a slide with uh, the point of access. Um, 
I saw Milan for sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, got it. Sorry. So there you go. So we're in all kinds of places uh, nearby. And so when I'm talking about some places able to deploy network quick, we had a customer come through and say, hey, do you have this particular city in India optimized and performant? And we said, actually, it's not our target of sub five milliseconds. And about four weeks later, we had it. And so we're a global network that operates at tech company speeds rather than existing ISP level. Shlomi Goodman, you look like you have a question. <laughs> yeah, I was holding myself. I was holding myself. I was <laughs> Come on, come on, let's kill it. <laughs> oh, he was, he was wondering why, why Tel Aviv is just on the roadmap. <laughs> oh, exactly, exactly. No, I think the uh, drop on the exchange, we can help. <laughs> and, anyway, my question is about uh, how do you deal with uh, skipping uh, when uh, ISPs are changing the routes and like you're finding yourself skipping between data center during a session? Uh, what is your solution for it and how well does it work? Oh. So that's one that I found was a massive nightmare and pain in the rear when I was just deploying RTP engines globally on the cloud locations and signaling. And so when designing the original subspace network, that was one of the big math problems that we uh, patented. So we've basically got it so that when your call comes into any one of our ingresses and that that session set up, it can flip and go to any other and it'll just pick up. So all of the other ones that it can possibly go to automatically know about your call and so if they suddenly get a strange packet unexpectedly, either a, a point of presence goes down, there's a fiber cut, any of those things that have happened, the calls will automatically switch over to the next pop and just keep going. And so the end users might see a little bit of a, a, a difference in latency, like a sudden one spike, but it's a flat line of latency for the call with that one stair step. And so we actually had to solve for that because that was a really, really big scaling problem. Because otherwise, and from the proxy level from the other side, from the carrier side, it will be the same session, the same IP. Yep. Because so. it's the same uh, four tuple uh, in source IP, in source port, uh, and in dest IP and in dest port on both sides of that call. Mm. So and all so of your IPs ever... are being in all over the data center. So mm -hmm. you can yeah, serve any IP from any point. Right. We're running multiple different virtual networks with the um, AnyCast IP ranges on both sides. And so we're able to make it work on both sides really effectively. I, I think voice end users would like just a little bit of flicker in the voice because they're probably missing it from the old ISDN days, you know, a little bit of frame slip. <laughs> uh, it was actually funny. So I had mentioned it while we were testing subspace really, really early on. I was actually listening to the audio because I've been working in telecom for so long and I could hear when there was an audio blip faster than uh, T-Shark uh, would tell me that there was a uh, latency. I remember getting to the point, and I'm like, hey, guys, we've got troubles here. I, I haven't heard anything in the last hour, and we've been doing all kinds of deployments and, and, and network flips and everything else. I'm like, I haven't heard anything. Like, are you sure it's actually going and doing those network changes? And in fact, it was. It's just it got down to the point where now we needed something more sensitive than a telecom engineer at your ear to be able to detect it. Great stuff. And Slomi. If you sign up and start reaching out with Dalen, we can probably see how to get that pop accelerated. We will, we will. <laughs> Promise to get you out. I might know people. <laughs> so do we have any other questions here, folks? All right, I think that's going to wrap us up for our talks for today. Let's give William a big round of applause. Thanks so hey, much, man. man. Hey, thanks for having me. Awesome. It's an awesome community. Can't wait to see. Can't wait to see the bugs that get filed uh, in strange ways by folks in this community. I'm sure they're coming. <laughs> you that's the, the, that's the final torture when you get into production. Yep. And I'm trying to make that torture a little bit smoother. So, at least from a network perspective. True. Sp speaking of torture, is is Liv you going to get the? Um, the uh, prize machine on the go. I think he's warming the picker up. I can see his eyebrows like yeah. twitching. 
Okay, folks. Bogdan, let us know what are our amazing prizes and parting gifts for today. Uh, let's uh, let's see if uh, William wants to take the last question on Slack. Does Subspace have hearing oh. agreements with each country's telco, or you maintain your own props physically? And then we're oh. gonna jump to prices. <laughs> and thank you, because that actually reminded me I forgot the announcement at the end. Okay. Ooh. Uh, so yes, we are actually peering with effectively, our, our goal is to peer with every single telco and deploy inside telcos on national levels. Um, so the answer is that 20% physical pops, that's where we're actually deploying inside. Uh, and the announcement that I was going to talk about is the global turn is open and anybody who registers for TADHack will get jumped to the head of the line and get two weeks of access to subspace. The condition is you've got to talk to Dalen uh, who's on the channel here, and you've got to tell us about what your project and what you want to build. Did you get it for two weeks? Nice. Wow. wow. Look at Livy. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> Especially the idea to be in front of the rest of the people. <laughs> that <laughs> sounds really, really appealing. <laughs> now, the caveat to it. It'll be on the developer integration side of the network, so performance won't be um, as great as our production network, which will at least be able to test it out, prove it, and see how it works. And if you find a creative bug, I'm super curious. Um, William, can you or anyone from your team just uh, share a quick uh, link uh, where yeah. they can subscribe? Oh, you said yeah. that through the tab, right? So just yep. some indication where, where they should go uh, in order to... Uh, Register. Yep, I will pull that up really quick. Last slide. In the meanwhile, if you just fire up the engines. <laughs> Get her roaring. <laughs> All right, let's see. Window. Uh, Google Meet's having a problem now. Can't do it. All right, so oh. I will drop that in Slack. Sure, yeah, that's an option too. Thanks, thanks, William. Thanks, folks. Uh, well, it will be yeah great to proceed now after the such a great presentation. But uh, we compete on a completely different level, going with prizes. So the raffle, uh, as uh, we learned in the first uh, today, um, uh, we have uh, one uh, one Open uh, 2021 as a, as a prize. Uh, and also the uh, one romantic one-to-one -one hour for doing design clinics with the OpenSIPS uh, team. So uh, uh, these are the prices uh, for, for today. Tomorrow we will have uh, uh, another similar set, but keep in mind Friday, it's a special day uh, when we have the big prize. If you want to check what is the big prize, just check on the website and you'll find it over there on the OpenSIP Summit um, uh, webpage. So, without with you. giving too much away, Bogdan, I'd just like to say that the big prize is very beautiful. Thank you. Okay, ready when you guys are. All right, Livio. Let's do it. Mr. Carlos Oliva. From Carlos! Louis. Are you here? Let's Carlos, see. he's here. Hey, hey, well done. Well done. And well done, Livio, for having a revised version of the tool that works. It's definitely been better since Monday. <laughs> yeah. And uh, now let's see for the design clinics. All right. Ask Kobzar. Congratulations. Oh. Yep. But is he Stas. here? Stas, are you here? Stas. 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 Come on. Stas. Stas. Wake up. Stas. Stas. Out of the restroom, Stas. Stas. No. Stas. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do it. Yeah, Come yeah, on. Yeah, you can yeah, do yeah. it. Let's go. There is still a bit of time. Until there I copy is not a bit of time. Ay, 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 oh, ay, he's ay, here. He's here. He's okay. here. Finally. Okay. <laughs> Just under the gun. 
Yeah. Where is? Congratulations. Where is right. that? Where he's is? Typing. He's typing. I, I maybe uh, type A. Just type anything. Yeah. <laughs> Show a sign of life. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. Hi. laughs> awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, ladies nice. and gentlemen, tech heads, entrepreneurs, speakers, that's the end of our show for today. Please, uh, what? Oh, I'm sorry. Bogdan? No, no, no. I just wanted to say that uh, that was a really great day number three. And we are keep going. That was a really great day number three. Three I great see, speakers. You can see from all the faces here that um, we're still excited to bring you another two days starting tomorrow. Same time, same bat channel. And, same place. Uh, same, same place. Same place. Uh, we look forward to seeing you. Thank you again for showing up and enjoying the content that we provided for you. Just so you know, we're very, very close. We have two more days to do it. We're going to reach this goal. Uh, just keep in mind that we have two more days of conferences. Of conferencing, sorry. Uh, still, the overall event will continue next week. On okay. Monday, we have uh, uh, four wonderful workshops. So really useful, low-level tech information for you guys, learning how to do things. So uh, that's for Monday. And uh, Tuesday, we have the OpenSips training. So just, just be aware of this. Uh, check the check the calendar the we uh, we shared on the um, web page on uh, you'll have all the information over there with uh, all the sub parts of the of the summit and if people want to watch this all again they can review on the open sips YouTube channel is that correct yes thanks to Maxim for doing a great job on on that. And thanks for doing it from Amsterdam, Max. We really appreciate you getting out there. I know. But you see, I know Max you see how we, we split the... across the road. I'm staying in the lobby, and he's on the other side of the street in the conference room. And, and I noticed that in reverence to the other conference participants, Max has gone less zoomy in and outy today. He's been a little bit more static. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've received some complaints. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> You know, we will find something else to complain about, don't we? Okay, one of the prizes on oh, Friday is motion sickness pills. <laughs> See, I'm looking at the background there, trying to figure out which year is that, Maxim? Um, it's, it's the eternal year. <laughs> Probably two years ago, or one of the last. Yeah, uh, 18 or 19. With, uh, with Basilios uh, in... Uh... Basilios in the corner, is that Nitsan? <laughs> I think that's Nitsan behind him. <laughs> Do one of these and pick his number. Yeah, no. yeah, 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 it is, it is. <laughs> okay, everyone. Well, thanks again for the participation. Thank you so much to all the speakers. Thank you to Subspace, our sponsor. We're looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. Everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. See Bye. you tomorrow. Have a great thanks day. Bye. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.